And also seeing a presence of a quorum, uh, call the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.31 p.m. So uh, we have a packed agenda tonight, and it's divided into two sections. The first is, as you just noted, noted a joint meeting with the Amherst uh, School Committee. And so for the purposes of that uh, meeting, which includes a math update, as well as a discussion and vote on the Collaborative for Educational Services expansion, um, we are entertaining a public comment section of our agenda. So if anyone has a public comment pertaining to that portion of the agenda, we welcome you to come forward to the microphone now. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, as is often noted, um, oh, by the way, we're being reco recorded for later, right? Yep. Well, this is the last meeting that will be recorded. Um, they're trying to try out the streaming tonight, and thanks to Amherst Media, the Town of Amherst, and RIS Department, our next meeting will be live broadcast. Okay. So I just wanted to make a note. As Jeff said, we're in the bottom of the night. That's awesome. Ooh. We were supposed to <laughs> point out that it's being taped, and it'll be future broadcasts. <laughs> well, um, and with that, I'm going to close public comment period. Um, with the note again that we welcome your emails and letters, as well as future comments at the microphone. Uh, so the first item of business is uh, the math update. Do you want to introduce? I do. Um, so uh, we spent a significant amount of time last winter and spring. We had a math external math report that was completed. We've taken action steps uh, on a number of those items, uh, and it was on multiple agendas last year. And we thought now that we're into November uh, and nearing the you know, beyond the quarter mark, that we, the committee and the community would get an update about how the change is going. And I appreciate the committee's agreeing to do a joint meeting for this purpose, as well as one other, because when we talk about implementation grades 6 through 12, doing a presentation on just grade 6 without the larger context just didn't make a lot of sense when we <coughs> talked it through at, at, at the staff <coughs> level. And so this focus, tonight's focus will be particularly on the implementation of new math curricula uh, at those grade levels, 6 through 12, and our presenter tonight is going to be Jeff Friedman. And as you remember, last year in the math plan, we and the budget, we added a position, um, a temporary position to facilitate the implementation of the curriculum and other items as it relates to math uh, for the school year. And Jeff's been, uh, I want to publicly say, has been amazingly present in the schools, uh, ranging from the elementary schools to the middle school and the high school. Jeff has been a math teacher at our high school for some time, but has made really strong connections with the teachers implementing the new curriculum, has offered feedback, support, has been in classrooms, has jumped into teaching, including some sixth grade, uh, which is not uh, not necessarily your background experience, but has been greatly appreciated by staff. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff, who's gonna walk us through some of the highlights of the implementation and then take questions afterwards. I, I wanna Great. acknowledge that Tim Sheen's here as well, but Jeff will be the main course tonight on math. I don't need to adjust this, then, probably. Can you hear me? I guess. Right. Yeah, so, so teachers tend to be pretty loquacious, so I know I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a timekeeper here for 10 minutes, so I, I don't know if we get lights or anything like that. Or It'll be natural cues, <laughs> yes. So anyway, so, so I've been teaching math at the high school for 20 years here, um, and uh, I've really taught all the courses, pretty much pre-algebra through calculus. I taught one of the calculus courses last year. I also taught IMP for 14 years, so I've got a lot of experience in sort of both of those pathways. Uh, before that, I taught in Northampton. I taught math and science, and before that, I was an engineer out in California. Um, so I love the teaching and, and, and learning of mathematics, and I'm, I, I want to say thank you to Mike and Tim, uh, Jane Muti, uh, Tiffany, Thibodeau and uh, Mickey Gramacki, who sort of, uh, you know, brought this uh, this position uh, to my attention and have been supporting me and giving me counsel because it's really, it's 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 a it's a new position and as such, um, I I look to these folks for guidance along the way at every at every turn. So um, so I want to just give you a little bit of background and I guess yeah you can look at me at their place. Um, so three main things that, that my job entails is supporting, as, as Mike said, uh, supporting teachers in their classrooms with implementing open up resources, which is in the sixth grade at four different elementary schools and in seventh and eighth at the middle school and then CPM, college prep math, at the high school. So I'm in and out of lots of different classrooms in, in lots of ways supporting that. And I'll give you three specific anecdotes in a moment. Uh, and then vertical alignment, which is really so that kids have continuity in the content of what they're experiencing over the grades, um, as well as in the pedagogy, in the, in the um, 
in the, in the teaching practices and what's expected of them um, that's presented by teachers. And then in a family engagement, how to uh, you know, facilitate timely, relevant information going to parents and, and opening <coughs> avenue for two-way conversations because parents are, are partners in this. Um, so, so three little anecdotes. I'll, I'll start with family engagement. So um, the elementary schools have math nights, at least three of the elementary schools that we're working with have math nights, family math nights, where kids are engaging in mathematics, fun games and puzzles and whatnot. So I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have some high school students representing sort of the diversity of who we are in Amherst um, there? So I've, I've been going around just this last few days to a bunch of classrooms and doing a little sales pitch and I've already got eight kids already, girls and boys, um, of, of diversity of uh, you know, students of color and Caucasian students um, who are going to be helping out uh, next Thursday night at Crocker Farm School. And what I said to the kids <coughs> in the appeal was that, uh, you know, so I, I have a girl in front of me who's a ninth grader, and I said, imagine a second grade girl at Crocker um, who's playing a game with you, and she sees this high school girl who's engaged in mathematics and having a great time with it, and she's a second grader, and she's thinking about, you know, looking up to this kid, and vice versa for the high school kids to be able to kind of, you know, uh, engage younger kids in what they're doing. So I think that's really cool. That's just a tangible thing. One of the things that I've, I've been doing a lot is working at the middle school in um, trying to clarify and fully understand and help communicate out to parents and the kids sort of what are your choices? Because when you get into, into middle school, you have a choice in seventh grade. Do you continue with what's called math seven or do you step up to math seven flex? And what does that entail and how does that work and what are the ramifications for your sort of paths through school? Um, and sort of trying to clarify some things with the middle school folks. Um, oh, another example is uh, working, I've worked with a couple high school teachers and I've been maybe about a dozen classrooms, high school teachers, um, one that I was working with a couple weeks ago was really on sort of I spent three year, three days in her classroom getting to know the kids and the curriculum and her style and then put the question to her, um, what do you want me to look at? What do you want me to focus on? And, and then, and it takes something of the teachers to commit some time, but she and I met then the next day during 10 minutes of her prep period to sort of talk about what she was going to do and then we processed it afterwards. Um, so it's sort of a variety of things that I'm doing. Um, and they're all in, you know, the overall uh, goal of to sort of work toward student um, achievement. So quick little model here, the way I think about student growth and achievement, because you all and Mike have invested a lot of money in, a new, in two new curricula and, and all the sort of support and professional development. Curriculum is a really important part. The teachers and the fabulous teachers that are in district are a key part. Uh, the district and its support of these endeavors, key. Peer culture in classrooms is is a key part of, of what makes students uh, grow and achieve. Parents and guardians are our allies. We want to work with them. And then the students themselves, their, their growth and their kind of being able to reflect on their own mathematics and the things where they've stumbled, stumbled and things where they're growing. So I, I just think you know, curriculum is, a, is an important piece, a vital piece of it, but there are some other vital pieces too. Um, everything that we're trying to do is rooted in um, something that, that Tim um, had us worked through, which was terrific last year. I call it a very much a living document. It's um, our, our vision and core commitments for math education. And I'll just read one thing. We aspire to create classrooms and schools where all students have access to a high quality engaging math program. So and the core commitments are really what uh, students, teachers, parents and guardians in the district all sort of what stake they have in and, and how they play a role in student success. So that's sort of a document that guides my work and I say it's a living document because I think it's something where we can critically look at it and say, oh, we need to tweak that and, um, and, and make it really relevant. So um, quick update, there's been various pr professional development endeavors uh, in the summer. The, the uh, sixth through eighth grade teachers uh, um, did some work with Open Up Resources uh, with, facilitated by some outside folks uh, and time to meet and uh, plan for transition. Uh, at the high school, we have a CPM trainer, so somebody who's an ex experienced math teacher who's working with lots of schools in Massachusetts. Um, she's cut, she came in, well, two of them came in uh, a couple times. We just had a training the other day, and we get another training, um, as well as two classroom visits from that person. Um, and we also had a joint meeting of the, the middle and high school 
uh, which I think should happen more often. Um, and then ongoing PD, I, you know, I'm, I'm providing support. Uh, we've got some ongoing workshops with the CPM trainer. And then we're trying to tap into, I've talked with uh, leaders from various other districts, including locally and in the Boston area, um, who are also in early years of implementation of these curricula, some with more experience, um, and some really maybe only in their second or third year. So trying to tap into doing simple things like Zoom conferences or phone calls or emails or Facebook connections, because uh, there's resources out there for teachers to support their work. So um, critical thing that's happening at the middle school is a new position this year. Um, uh, occupied by one teacher and he is working really in three things, helping to support teachers in the implementation of <coughs> new curricula, so working with them inside and outside of the classrooms. A second thing is identifying students who need additional support to be successful. Intervention, very much like sort of various models of intervention that they do in the middle school, but finding it's critical in the middle sorry, in elementary schools, finding it's critical in the middle school, and then based upon identifying those students, um, those students meet with him every other day, in addition to their regular math class, to, to provide that added support. Previewing ideas, reviewing things, filling in gaps, um, that, that's really powerful. There's some additional needs there as well. Um, and here's the, the, the last thing, and I know Mike has given Tim and me some directive in this area, but how do you evaluate the success of something new like a curriculum, new, new curriculum or curricula? And that's, you know, you can look at hard data, but, uh, but that takes time. You know, it takes time to implement these programs. Um, and you can also <coughs> find out sort of anecdotally um, what's going on. And, and we can also do surveys and whatnot. We haven't done any formal surveys of teachers, students, or parents and guardians, but certainly that's something that we will be looking into and thinking about how to do that in, in meaningful ways. But just some qualitative feedback. This is from, you know, a sixth grade teacher, a seventh grade teacher, two high school teachers. Here are some things here. Um, and I'll just read a couple of them uh, from uh, elementary level and sixth grade. Students love the program. They say it's better than what they've been used to. It's structured to support growing competence. It's very well scaffolded in sixth grade. And I spent a couple weeks in a sixth grade classroom. Um, there's engaging in real life problems. Um, End of unit projects are thoughtful. Um, lessons and homework have a predictable structure. One of the things powerful that's happening at the high school is that um, the book looks very mathy, and also parents and students can go when they do homework. The homework problems are online, hints are online, <coughs> and answers are online. And that's sort of a double edged sword, I will say. I think it's fantastic. You know, I talked to my daughter, who's a 10th grader, and she said, Yeah, it's useful. But you also want to uh, as educators, you want to um, you want to teach kids how to use a resource like that wisely. You know, some kids will go click, 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 and write down what they see, and and other kids will be a little more judicious about that. And and we want our kids to to, to learn how to learn. And if if the homework help, those tips are, are really helpful for them. Fantastic. But we want to avoid kids sort of abusing that as a resource. And then some challenges. A lot of teachers I'm talking with, especially when you teach a new curriculum and some of you are educators. Um, you know, the first time through, trying to, to live up to, oh, the, the <coughs> curriculum says you can do that in, in 45 minutes, and you're finding, oh, I need 55 minutes or something. Pacing is something that's going to just take time. And it's beautiful. I was talking with a teacher the other day who was looking at not, not undermining anything, but really focusing in on what's the big idea and how do I orchestrate together time. This is in sixth grade and then time where kids are working in groups or individually and she can get around to kids. So that takes some orchestration. It takes time with the curriculum. There's also just some little nitpicky things um, uh, that some of the workbooks, there might be a question on the bottom of a page and kids are like, where are the triangles? And then they have to turn the page to find. So, you know, these are, th those are minor things and I think we'll get in communication with the publisher and say, hey, are you gonna come up with a, a new workbook? These are, these are not edible workbooks. Uh, what do you call it? workbooks? Workbooks that the students use and then they consumable. Consumable. Yes. <laughs> Please cut that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, and another critical thing, which is time immemorial. I mean, I'm, I've been here 20 years, and and that last point is finding and making time. And I, I look to our leadership in that regard to really, you know, it. Um, and there's some structural things and schedules that make, you know, given common planning time and whatnot. But that's that's. 
that's something to continue to <coughs> dig at, finding time for you two who are teaching the same course for you to have that time to collaborate. So, um, so that is, let me just see, I don't, I don't think there's anything else. But yeah, so thank you. <laughs> uh, happy to answer questions, and if I can't answer them, I'll write them down and get back to you. So, Great. Are there questions to the committee? Mr. Bunch? Yeah, it's not a quit. Well, I have a comment and a question. Yeah. Um, I worked with you for, what, 10 or 15 years? It and, was a um, long time. No, I can't even. <laughs> I, one of my mentors. Continue, one of my mentors. I Thank continue you. to admire and respect your professionalism. Um, and tonight I think you've done an excellent job of demonstrating your commitment to kids, your commitment to mathematics, and your commitment to making sure that this conceptual framework works. And so I want to thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, my question is um, related to the challenges. What can you identify specifics that you would need from administrators to begin to address those challenges? Uh, do you, are you looking at a particular one? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> so suppose uh, teachers, uh, the, you know, the seventh grade teachers, I mean, I, this is a hypo hypothetical, but suppose seventh grade teachers had some additional time where they could look together, and it's hard when you haven't taught, uh, when you have lots of experience, the teachers are really savvy and experienced, but you haven't taught the curriculum to work through it uh, and do that sort of backwards design. Now that we understand the whole unit, a unit might take 20 days or something, and to have that time and, and to look at the sort of end of unit assessment and then think backwards, how do we, um, how do we implement this in ways that are gonna work with our kids? You take a curriculum and you, 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 you make it work for the kids in front of you. And um, so you know, I think that's, that's a piece of it is, is finding and making that time. And, 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 and I got to say, um, you know, they're dedicated folks and all. In my role, once, you know, when I'm step removed from the classroom, you, I quickly lose that palpable daily rhythm, like on a Sunday when I'm thick into planning and all. It's, it's a different role. And so, so I need to be just conscious of, that, that folks have limited time. They have so much on their plate. But I, I would say finding some, some you know, deliberate time in there, and I don't know if that's on early release days. There's sort of certain structured things. Um, you know, I, I, I think, dare I say, and I know Tim and I are talking about this, I think more so than any sort of like formal professional development, getting in external folks uh, to, 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 you know, tell us how to, how to do things, I think how, if, if you two are teaching the same course, finding more concrete time to, to, to look at what you're doing um, in this first year, that, that would be, that's a long way of saying making time for teachers. Um, Can I add yeah. one more to that? Yeah. Um, but if you have other ideas, no, love I, to I hear them. I wish I did. I, I'm just, uh, you know, mathematics has had kind of an interesting history in the district. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. I, I would like to see this be sustained over a period of time longer than other programs have. And so I guess my next question, my last question, I'll let you go, no, it's good. is it's um, good. what are the budgetary requirements to keep this sustainable? Do you have enough resources now? Um, what? Uh, uh, I have, m when you say budgetary, I mean, I would have to defer to you guys. <laughs> I have no idea of the budget time. To sustain you know, the program. These folks have made an investment in me as a teacher. I'm not teaching any of my own classes this year. That's a big investment, and okay. then they bought curricula. But, and you um, have enough time to do that? Say that again? You have enough time to do your work? Uh, yeah, I mean, but, you know, my, my personal work? Yeah. Yeah, sure, but, but you know, if uh, you're a creative, fabulous educator, you look at that list and... You know, and I, you know, I talk with my colleagues, uh, especially uh, Jane Muti, I'm talking with her today, is really within each of those three sort of bins, there's a world of things that could happen. And it's figuring out what are the, you know, gonna get the most bang for the buck, so to speak, you know, um, so, but I think there's a whole world of opportunity inside of each of those. I'll give you one concrete example. I've been in the district for 20 years, and I know uh, when I taught honors geometry and college prep geometry, uh, which I taught for 15 years or something like that. Love those courses. Um, and I love what I was doing in IMP as well. Um, but um, 
when I emailed out to parents, I'd emailed out to all parents once a week, BCC to parents, um, sort of telling them about something that we were doing that week to sort of uh, create a little hook for them to maybe talk with their high school kids if their kids are willing to engage. And um, I'd hear back from lots of the, the honors geometry parents, not many of the CP. This is not a judgment. This is not a judgment. Um, but um, I hear um, I, uh, you know, that there are folks in the community who um, have resources and have, um, have facility in, in connecting with teachers in the community um, who I hear from. And there are lots of other parents and community members that I want to hear more from as an educator. So in the whole family engagement arena, I think there's huge potential. I'm, I, I initiated a meeting. I'm going to meet with Marta Guevara next week and her crew to think about how do we engage families, all families, in, in mathematics, even with, with the very young kids. And, and you can imagine where that might go. But I, I see that, you know, uh, I'm all also working on setting up some space on the ARPS website for mathematics. But, but any of these things that we set up, I'm really conscious and want to be cognizant of, is everybody gaining access. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bigger, bigger conversation than this moment. But does that answer your, you know? Yes, it, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for asking. Love to keep going around. And, yep. uh, Isabel? Thank you so much. Um, thank you. That was um, really interesting. Um, I have a I have a seventh grader and a ninth grader, so I experience the transition I, I, very directly. Um, and from our family perspective, I would say it was very smooth. My kids barely noticed any difference. I don't I, I don't know that they would have noticed otherwise. But one thing um, that I, it's sort of a comment and a question, and building on the discussion that you just finished about engaging with families is. Yeah. Um, in the transition, particularly from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, we had had a lot of information about the progression and sort of what is the pathway for IMP. Yeah. And um, I know we you switched very, very quickly, but we didn't have that same kind of information for the new curriculum. For, for eighth grade? Eighth in grade into three. ninth grade into high school. Oh, your kid's a ninth grader, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, and, yeah. Good, good to know. And so when – and we hadn't – we – the way the school year ended, it was, we'll tell you where we're still working on math placements and we'll tell you what courses your, your student will be assigned to. And then we got the schedule and we didn't get any context for sort of how that fits Good into point. the- Good point. Duly the, noted. Yeah. yeah. Duly, and so I think, yeah. you know, because I felt yeah. very well informed about the IMP progression yeah. and that similar level of information and pathway and would have been really, really helpful. And it's not too late because I think you know it, it still would be helpful to have that mm -hmm. information and help families understand what where their child is being placed and what their next step could be or should be. Totally makes sense. And apropos to that is sort of when we sent out an email to and letter from the uh, middle school to all seventh grade parents and guardians, we sort of had a you know a, a sort of a sequence, a chart of sequence that included the middle school and the high school, yeah. which hadn't happened in the past. So. You know, and, and so that at least parents and their kids can kind of see pathways, uh, you know, and, and, and how you can find your way into what you want to do. But duly noted, duly noted. So I appreciate yeah. that you said it's not, not too late. No, We're it's working not, on yeah. a sixth, you know, communicating with all yeah. sixth grade parents right now. Um, so that's really helpful. That's helpful. Mr. Manu. Yeah. Uh, Ms. McDonald uh, mentioned placement. Is that the same thing as tracking? Uh, and if you do, what kind of factors do you use to place a kid in an advanced <coughs> class or a lower class? That's a great question. That's a big question. I know, so, but I'll... Yeah. No, I, I appreciate it. So suffice it to say, this is something that, I, you know, I've, I've been 20 years in my microcosm, and I, I, I'm, I'm given the, the luxury and the liberty of sort of zooming out. So right now I'm meeting with, for example, all the 7th and 8th grade teachers um, around... Uh, the courses at the middle school, but um, I would say it's not tracking. I would say the goal has been, as I understand, and I'm, I'm getting a history of this from various folks over the last, you know, five, five to ten years, is two words, access and equity, that, that um, should a district like ours have this split that happens in seventh grade, that your child may step up to flex and her child may uh, may choose to stay in Mass 7, both excellent courses with excellent teachers, 
And, but if your child later on decides, you know what, they're more mature, kids' brains developmentally get more mature and able to sort of do the abstraction that we do in algebra, uh, your kid has a path to step up. So we want to continuously support and challenge our kids. Uh, you know, so how that, uh, how that happens, it's, it's, you know, there's lots of interplay there. So, so and if, if your kid finds, oh my gosh, the, the really challenging sort of more honors level work is, is just too much for me, dad, um, that he or she can move, it can move either way. What I'm interested in is um, we aspire to have that. So it, it's not like you jump into one track and you're there for life. Um, but how does that work practically speaking? What are the practical realities of kids making that movement in either direction? And I think, I, you know, one thing I love about teaching in this district is people genuinely, teachers deeply care about all students. Whether the structure of things lives up to our aspirations is something that we got to keep chipping away at. But, um, you know, I think, you know, uh, my, my hope is, and I've certainly seen it over the years, that kids, the idea that anywhere between seventh grade and Miss, Miss Beauty has really tried to carve out ways, seventh through tenth grade, seven, eight, nine, ten, four years, where kids can, can, can have a chance to step up when they developmentally are ready for it. But that also presumes, and this comes back to a resource issue, um, that, hey, what about if I'm a kid, I'm in seventh grade, and, and I, I, I kind of feel pretty good about the math, but I'm still a little anxious. I want to step up to seventh flex. If there's support, if there's additional support for me, terrific. If there isn't support, and that support could be a, a class or an elective or something like that, if there's support for me, then we're going to help those kids make that leap. You know, so there's resource issues associated with it, and I'm talking for longer than I need to, but, no, okay. but, 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 but this is a great question. It's a great question. So um, I want to get a couple more questions in from the committee. Oh, okay. We have Mr. Demling, Ms. Ardonias, and then Mr. Sullivan. Okay. Um, so building on that theme a little bit, um, I, I am, yeah. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more detail about um, when that initial conversation of when students first get onboarded into deciding either between 7th and 7th flex and the geometry honors portfolio. Yeah. This seems like this really key pivot point. And, you know, you talked a little bit before about some parents are just naturally more um, asking questions and, and informed about the options, and some parents yeah. aren't as yeah. as informed. And, yeah. you know, we want to, there's this, uh, this is one of the first things I um, engaged with in the district like seven years ago when we first designed Flex with Ian Stith and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. And um, one of the toughest nuts to crack design-wise was you want to offer kids the opportunity or the intervention that they need immediately. Yep. yep. Um, and, and yet you don't want that to be too much of a uh, pass-fail, you know, high-stakes SAT kind of a moment. You, know, you want it to be a more gradual introduction. And uh, so we talked a lot about how that comes down to parent communication and that like we yeah. wanted to get away from like just this one, what this one letter that you get in sometime in the spring yeah. that all of a sudden this is where you're yeah. going. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about like what the current thinking is, what what we're doing now, and okay. what, what so, teachers are saying. Yeah, again, I've been you know, we're not in silos here, but I'm 20 years at the high school and I'm I'm still be, you know I'm getting to know the middle school more and more. Even though my three kids went through the middle school, and so I should have some familiarity familiarity. And you know, I think you know here's a, here's a concrete answer to that which is that um, the seventh grade teachers all emailed out to all seventh grade parents um, with certain different sort of boilerplate messages. Your kid clearly shows, you know, is really excited about mathematics. He or she has been doing all the challenge work. Uh, we recommend this course. And, and then there's sort of a dialogue. The ideal is it, and, and also, in, in the class that I was working with, the teacher met with every kid individually about, we had a little survey that they filled out, so the kid had a little bit of a stake. And again, they're seventh graders. How do they, how do they know that much? You know, some kids said, no, I don't want to. And then through sort of the, the praise and, 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 and the documentation of what they've done, you know what, we want you to step up. And parents are like, great. And in other cases, it's not appropriate. But, but um, so we reached out, and we don't hear back from every parent. So there are places, that's a tangible place where, um, and, and parents are deluged with stuff, and, and you know, there are lots of reasons why. So I'm interested in ways to make sure that every parent and kid, uh, that, that we, we as a team have that conversation. That's hard, you know, when you have, the teacher I was working with has 80 
um, 80 kids. To, so, so you look at sort of their track record and what they've done, but you know, it's not a perfect system. That's one reason why I'm spending time with the middle school kind of looking at what is our aspiration, and I appreciate the way Mike put it, what do we aspire to as a district, and then what, what are we actually doing? So I don't know if that, you know, but, but I also want to, apropos to what you said, is that um, we know that, you know, it, it, um, once, once you make a decision, the hope is in a truly caring, committed community and district like this is that, um, hey, if I'm not taking that, that, that more challenging course, uh, maybe next year I can. And that becomes, a, you know, it becomes a little more difficult. It also becomes a commitment, a choice. Like if I say, hey, your son could do this in eighth grade, son or daughter, I don't know, but, um, um, but they're going to need to have this, uh, they're going to get the benefit of this additional support class, but that means sort of digging into some of the other options they have at the middle school. And so that's, so that's a choice. And some kids are like, oh, I don't want to give up my, that sort of, I don't know what they call it at the middle school, some of those electives and some of those other, you know, I don't, I don't want to give up Miss, uh, um, the uh, drama teacher, um, I've forgotten her name. Miss Boniface. Yeah, Miss Boniface, it's a wonderful class. You know, so they're choices. But I, I hear what you're saying is how do we ensure that parent, student, and teacher really have that conversation and, um, at that point, but also along the way. So, yeah. Yeah, and I know we're running yeah. low on time, but I yep. wanted to just so. add something that was before uh, the add to Mr. Freeman said, yeah. but also that predated him in this role, which is that uh, there was a time, recent time in the district, where those decisions and those choices were made at the end of sixth grade. And we've shifted that, as, as you were noting, to after the first quarter of seventh grade, because what we found is sixth grade teachers were in a very awkward position of talking to students about that, because they weren't literally teaching the same, uh, in some ways, the same curriculum, and they weren't... Uh, well informed enough because they're focused on being elementary school teachers to be able to offer <coughs> you know authentic guidance to students and to families and so uh, mm. one of the concepts or one of the rationales for moving it to the first quarter seventh grade it gives every student an opportunity to be in a middle school math classroom it allows for relationships to form between teachers who will literally be teaching both the flex and the seven uh, the math seven course and so that those conversations that Mr. Freeman talked about can be much more informed uh, and much more supportive to families and students in making that decision. And, and the word I'd use, and you use a slightly different one, but is coaching. You know, that some students may need to be coached, that they, are, they do have the requisite skills and, you know, encouraged to take part in that. It was really hard to ask sixth grade teachers across um, four different districts and six different schools to be able to do that effectively and consistently. It just And frankly, it was just not possible. So that was another structural shift along that same dimension. So we had uh, two more questions, uh, Mr. Donius and Mr. Sullivan. Um, I will try to keep this brief, but uh, thank you. I will take notes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for taking the time to uh, yeah, walk pleasure. us through some of the work that's been going on here. And it made me um, happy to hear that you are going to be meeting with uh, Dr. Guevara to discuss um, you know, how to engage families. One of the issues that I've raised with Mr. Sheehan before and also with Dr. <coughs> Morris um, has been the findings of the report that was done uh, a couple of years ago now, the math study that led to the working group, which found that there was an achievement gap among uh, Latino students in particular. And as we know, a lot of these gaps actually start from, you know, from elementary school age, right? Yeah. And one of the reasons why we're having a joint meeting tonight is so that we can think about how to improve the experience for students going from the elementary schools into their you know, middle and high schools. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, um, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm hearing a lot about uh, reaching out to parents, trying to engage them, you know, bring them into the, the fold, if you will, uh, to help strengthen their, their kids' experience and their students' experience in the schools. Uh, but I was wondering if you could just spend a, a couple of minutes describing how you see the work of this program specifically, you know, focused on improving the achievement gap there, um, appealing directly to the parents and caregivers of students who need <coughs> perhaps that extra help, and if there are any specific areas um, where you anticipate perhaps even more intensive attention or resources that we can be helpful in providing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, so a couple things. One is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trained in middle school and high school mathematics and science. So in my role is sort of six through 12, although I'd, I'd like to think that it's all interrelated. So I, I can't necessarily, you know, I, you know, certainly from my own experience over the years, 
it very much is a K-12 thing, you know, because um, some kids um, have, you know, I'm going to put it starkly, um, in, in, in the same way that you walk into uh, some people's homes and apartments and there might be very few books. And you go into other people's homes and, and apartments and there's just teeming with books. Uh, some, some homes have... Uh, uh, you no know, games or puzzles, or and, and some have tons of games and puzzles. I, I don't mean to put it so sort of simply and starkly, but but I, th I think it, it starts very very young, um, and so uh, you know uh, my interest in reaching out to Miss Guevara was that they have just this wealth of experience with how to reach all parents and and parents who me even though I've been tried to be deliberate as 20 years as a high school teacher that uh, that I haven't been able to reach, and so looking forward to their ideas. But I, you know, I think I, I've been working with the registrar here um, to get statistics, and they would not surprise you or me sort of what, um, what the sort of makeup is of, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of the, the flex class versus the, the non-flex class, or the honors algebra in grade eight <coughs> versus um, uh, the, the regular algebra, and split along um, uh, sort of, Caucasian versus um, students of color, uh, split along um, uh, full lunch versus free and reduced lunch. That's a really stark difference. Uh, free and reduced kids may be, uh, you know, 40% of, uh, I, I, and I, I don't have the statistics, well, they're in my binder, but 40% of the, of the eighth graders, but in the honors eighth grade math, uh, there are 8% of the kids in there. You know, so, so there are those statistics, which I don't think would surprise any of us. And this is a broad societal thing, but what can we do in this fabulous place called Amherst? At every, my interest is in at every step of the way, K-12, where are there places where we can do a little bit better? Um, I don't know enough about early childhood education to sort of speak to the, the, you know, the K, through, K through five. Um, and I'd sort of defer to, to other folks who are much more schooled in that. But um, yeah, yeah, so I don't know if that quite, I don't have a lot of specific ideas yet, although I'm sure we could come up with some, you know, um, I don't, yeah. I think it's just, <laughs> a, it's an area where yeah. we certainly want to get some answers. Yeah, um, and Definitely. And address that, you know, sooner rather than later. Because, again, I think given the work of, you know, the, the working group, uh, as well as the conversations that we've had here on both committees, actually, um, clearly this is an issue that needs to be addressed, you know, very soon. And hopefully um, you're the person to do that. <laughs> well, I, can I give one other specific an anecdote? And, 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 and this, um, you know, um, if I'm getting anybody in trouble here, my apologies. But um, so there used to be a class. So imagine you have a son or daughter who's in seventh grade, and you're like, gosh, with some support, he really could do that math flex. There used to be a class uh, that was eliminated a couple years ago, and I'm not exactly sure why, I'm not privy to that information, that supported those kids to go, to, to, to get that extra help that they needed. Because where do you, how do you distinguish in seventh grade between a kid who should go into that class and that class? Well, there's some obvious measures, but there are other sort of more intangibles and other things that with su some support. And I'm, I'm, I'm not questioning anybody's integrity, but I do wonder what happened to that course that, that used to be there. It's not there now. And various people at the middle school have said, gosh, it would be fabulous to have that course to really support all those kids, including kids mm -hmm. who historically haven't been in that. It's addressing this, I wouldn't say achievement gap as much sort of opportunity gap, but um, so there are concrete pla places all along, along the way, but I really appreciate you asking about that. That is important to me, really so, important. Uh, I want to get in, Mr. Yeah. Lee. We're almost out of time, so I want to okay. get in Mr. Sullivan's question. I think I went question. way over. So, so I'm, I'm very excited we're not discussing the problem of the week anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But any, so I'm I'll just, give you a problem of the week afterwards and start solving <laughs> it, but you might get distracted. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely okay. get distracted. <laughs> so my question is, what sort of feedback is the math department getting from the special ed teachers in the liaisons as to how <coughs> the, the students are acclimating to college prep math? Great. I don't have an answer to that. I honestly don't know. It's a great question, and duly noted. I, you know, I, you know, um, and again, at this point, I, it it would be in that sort of qualitative, anecdotal. That's a right. great it's question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I don't know, but 
it's on my agenda for tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, okay. uh, Ms. Stancer wants to ask a question. Oh. Sorry, okay. I just thought of something I would like to yeah, ask. No, okay. um, so no, there's a lot of conversation about them, you know, moving kids up and supporting them, and I think that's all great. But what are you doing for the students who you who are not going to go up? Are they feeling supported as well? <sighs> Are they feeling alienated or less than? And, and what, if anything, can you do about that if that's the case? That's the, that's the million dollar question. Because, um, and, and, and I, you know, uh, that's all for me in my own endeavor to understand the issues mm -hmm. um, as part of my conversation at the middle school is yeah, your child, um, it, you know, so, so we don't want it to be a have and have not situation. Mm -hmm. Whenever you split kids up though, there's that dynamic, and, and I've always rationalized in the 20 years that I've been here that I love about this is that I'm gonna bring my best 100% to my honors class and to my non-honors class and support every kid where, where they are in their own path. Because it's not a race, it's right. not a race. Yeah. We wanna be, right. we wanna meet you where you are and be slightly above, you know, to, you know. Um, but, um, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of supports for kids, but um, but there are also lots of challenges there. I mean, I, certainly at the high school, there's all kinds of resources to help support kids. Um, but uh, we need to meet, meet those kids' needs as well. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of concrete things that I can say right at the moment. That's but all right. so but I'm, I'm glad you asked an it. Observation. So yeah, we're gonna, no, we're yeah. Gonna, we're going to revisit this topic. And I think already, based on the conversation we've had, this is something that come sometime after January. Uh, we're gonna wanna throw this on the agenda again, welcome you back, and um, maybe even brainstorm from the committee some questions in advance, so that when you come in, you'll, you'll actually know in advance some of the questions that people are gonna wanna know. I'm not asking for a response. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna give you a last word if you want one. I think given time, I'll wait till that January session, but thank you. <laughs> You're very, very welcome, thank you very much. Thank you, thank and you. Thank, you thank, you thank you for your excellent questions. and and uh, interest in what we're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Chair. Sure. <laughs> so I guess I'm on for the next item. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, Collaborative for Educational Services Expansion. And I just want to give a very special welcome uh, to Mr. Deal, who's here from the uh, Collaborative for Educational Services. And they are a wonderful partner of our schools uh, and our districts. And um, as a representative from the Amherst Regional School Committee, I uh, serve on the board. Um, and I'm happy to um, have Mr. Deal here. And we are here as a reminder for those who uh, may not have been present at our last meeting uh, or who may be watching at home. Um, we are, as members of the collaborative, uh, being asked to approve which is part of just the bylaws, right? The, the laws of, of the collaborative. Approve uh, the application by Gateway Regional and Worthington School Districts uh, to be added to the collaborative. So by law, whenever a school district wants to be added to the collaborative, uh, each and every member committee from the different districts has to approve uh, that, that request. So Luckily, only two-thirds have to approve it, but they'll have to vote on it. Okay, yes. so they, they're, thank you very much for the, the correction. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Deal, unless you. Dr. Morris, if there's anything else that you want to add to thank that. Thank you very much. So I also want to take the opportunity to say a little bit about the collaborative, hence the folders. I've been in education for 40 years, and you learn early in education, you have to have a plan B and C in your back pocket. So I'm going to go with Plan C, which is most of my information will be in this packet and not verbal, or move things along quickly. Uh, the collaborative has a couple buildings in Northampton, as you know, and a couple schools and programs, where you actually are a collaborative of 36 school districts. Um, and so the collaborative is the districts, and we just happen to be a central point that organizes things on their behalf. And I want to say, first of all, that Dr. Morris has been a terrific collaborator, <coughs> a partner, a friend, uh, a co-thinker with me on a number of different areas, and I really appreciate all of your support and, and effort. Likewise. And then a couple of you are either members of the board or have been past members. So in a sense, Ms. Uh, Ms. Or Ordonis. Ordonis, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you know, wonderful member of the board, and really appreciate all your service. And Mr. Sullivan, thank you as well. And my good friend Kip Ponch over here was a board member when I first started as executive director, and back in the saddle, good to see you as well. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, I don't want to tell you what's in this folder, then we'll go on to the vote part of it in order to keep within the time frame. Uh, so if you don't know the collaborative, I put a few things in here to give you some familiarity with it. 
The first thing is our mission, core statement, core values. We really focus on providing all kinds of services and programs for children, youth, and families, especially those placed at risk of failure. The second thing in your, in your packet is our five-year strategic plan. And I want to point out quickly the four goals. The first one is serving member district needs. So that's our very first goal. And so we continue to try to get information from our board, from our superintendents, from the people we work with in terms of what the needs are of the district and then try to meet those. The second goal is to have great services for children, youth, and families, the special education programs, after school programs, and so on in that area. The third goal is to develop exemplary educators through licensure, PD, and so on. And lastly, to support innovation in our districts. So you can look at that in your leisure. The next piece is this services overview. And in here, if you don't know the collaborative, it talks about all the different services we provide. Um, and they're divided up in a couple of different areas. But most importantly, what goes with that is this colorful sheet, which I want to turn more of your attention to. So this grid is something that we put together um, pretty much annually. If all of our member districts, you'll find all 36 districts on here. And on the left-hand side are our different services we provide special education, professional development, research evaluation, and so on. And then you have X's next to all the services that your district uses. So if you look on the Hampshire County side, your districts are the first three. Um, and you can see there's an awful lot of X's uh, in those areas. We, we work a lot with Amherst. We're very pleased about that. Amherst works with us a lot. And I think across the board, we're able to provide a lot of services for Amherst, Amherst Regional, and Pelham. So we're very pleased about that. So you can look at this at your leisure. We're moving pretty quickly. Well, while you do that, I just want to note uh, whether un intentional or unintentional uh, for Amherst Regional, uh, one thing that I'll be coming back at the next meeting and talking about is the Spiffy Coalition Prevention Needs Assessment Survey has two X's. Maybe that's because we're utilizing a lot of your services. No, 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 that's not. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a too fast. <laughs> it'd be appropriate one way or the other because in some of the work that I'll be sharing out uh, around vaping prevention and mm. substance use prevention, uh, the collaborative has been a critical partner uh, and continue and uh, we're continued yes, partnership on that to uh, truly make a difference in our prevention approaches. So I, I like the two X's. That's, that's all I was saying. Okay, yeah. two X's is good. Uh, the PD calendars after that, in case you want to see that, and then I want to turn your attention to the brown or buff or whatever they're called um, pages, which is more detail about our services to Amherst, Amherst Regional, and Pelham. So dividing it out in these different areas, we actually have more detail here about our. PD services directly on site, as well as our special education services. You're part of our Title III consortium, ELL, part of our cooperative purchasing program. Um, do a lot with early childhood in, in Amherst. Uh, Mike mentioned our Spiffy Coalition on the second page, a lot around that. After school programs, you have an exemplary program at the high school that we help run. Um, and the end has a lot about Spiffy and our healthy families. So as Mike mentioned, there's the PNAS survey that was recently completed, and I guess it's going to be presented here soon. And that's an important part of the service we provide. So that's a pretty quick overview, and I just want to see if anyone has any questions about that really fast overview. Most of you already know the collaborative, but those of you who don't, if you have questions about that. Great. OK. So let me turn the attention then to the vote that we would like you to have. Um, the collaborative agreement was signed in 2004. It was a state requirement. They pretty much laid out what had to be in it. Um, and so all of our member districts at the time, 36 of them, signed the agreement. Um, it went then to the Board of Education for their signature, et cetera. And part of the collaborative agreement gives a way to make, do amendments. It turned out to be more convoluted than one would expect, but not unlike typical education stuff, as you know. <coughs> um, so we had two different districts who approached us last year to become members of the collaborative. That's Gateway Regional and Worthington. And they're the last two districts in Franklin and Hampshire County to be members. So if they join, if they're approved for membership, they'll make a complete complement of all the districts in the two counties. That's pretty much our catchment area. Um, so we want to have a vote on that, and I want to put on a couple things in your, the, the uh, articles that you're actually agreeing to. So if you have the articles in front of you, um, on the very first page, you have Gateway, Re you probably use it in color, but you have Gateway Regional and Worthington mentioned in the first paragraph. And then the second paragraph talks about 
uh, having two-thirds members approval. This is a change in the bylaws. The bylaws before said everybody had to approve it, and that's a heavy lift, of course. So this is one change in the, in the collaborative regulations. On the fourth page, I believe. While you're, while you're doing that, just for people viewing, you know, either the committee members but also people who have the packet, it is um, the top of the document that's being referenced is Agreement oh, of the you. Collaborative for Educational Services, formerly known as Hampshire Educational Collaborative, and there is some shading that's indicated. Oh, there's shading. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, good, good. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make One sure. One day we'll done. drop the formerly Hampshire Education Collaborative also. Right? <laughs> so on the uh, fourth page, enlargement of the board, this is another change which is we're happy about, but it's not that mi major. The originally, the collaborative agreement said the Department of Education, Elementary Secondary Education, would appoint a member, a voting member, to our board, which we kind of didn't necessarily like that much. But it turns out Desi had no capacity to send 25 of their members out to the collaboratives. So they decided to drop it. Instead, we have a liaison at Desi, who's a really good liaison. Helps us a great deal. So that's a change. Uh, the next change is on page 9. It, it changes twice. This change is that in the past, the agreement said that we would uh, give a surcharge for non-member districts of no more than 20%. And the board requested we raise that to 25%. That's he said, okay, so it's now in the agreement that we're going to approve. This helps underwrite and support our member. About half of our business comes from non-members, and they pay 25% more than members do for the services, which allows us to keep costs a little bit lower for member districts. So it's a, a benefit of membership. Uh, and it's one reason, of course, why Gateway and Rulington want to be members. Um, so two different places that occurs, changes just the percentage we're able to surcharge. And lastly is on page 14, which is the effective uh, part, when this will be effective. Um, and the statement about they will become members upon this. So basically, we need two thirds of our school districts to school committees to approve this, and then it goes to DESE. This has been a long process. It's been to DESE several times, et cetera. So we're in the final stretch, and we want to do it by January 31st. So that gives time for the commissioner um, to approve it for their membership next year. So I'm making the rounds of school committees, and I just want to say, in my final word is, it is such a pleasure, and always have a little bit of a chill when I meet with school committees um, across the board. They're all different, but every one of them is made up of folks like you who are citizens. You give up your own time. You run for office. You really are dedicated to having excellent outcome for the <coughs> kids in Amherst, Pelham, and Amherst Regional. And it's such a dedicated work that you do, and I think it goes unsung. So I'd like to sing it because I really, <laughs> I, no, seriously, I really value the work that you do on behalf of, of children, youth, and families. So thank you very much for that. And I think on your agenda you have the actual vote that we want. We, we do. I just right? wanted to quickly uh, see if anyone had any questions for you before yeah. I entertain a motion. Seeing no questions, I'd entertain a motion. Make sure you to entertain a motion. You started I, this. I will entertain a motion. <laughs> Actually, you need to do for the Amherst Committee anyway, right? Yes, that's right. true for both for both committees. Right. So for the Amherst School Committee, um, if anyone wants to make a, a motion, and the language is on uh, the agenda. Mr. Nakajima? I move for the Amherst School Committee to approve the September 25th, 2019 revised and amendment agreement of the Collaborative for Educational Services. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion or questions? All those in favor from the Amherst School Committee, please raise your hand. Any nays? Nope. We have unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, I would entertain a similar motion for the Regional School Committee. For the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee to approve the September 25th, 2019 revised and amended agreement mm -hmm. of the Collaborative for Educational Services. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and seconded by uh, Stancer, um, Donald Stancer. Uh, all those in favor? Of the, any, any debate? Seeing no debate. All those in favor mm -hmm. of the motion signify aye. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you Appreciate very much. Here. And this is for our signature. Yep. And there are how many committees listed on here? We have 36 committees. 36 committees listed on here. List. Thank you You'll very much. You'll be visiting committees <laughs> to the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to just cut out for me for a while. <laughs>
what number are these two, Mr. Deal? We actually up to 18 here have already voted our schedule, which is good. That's half. Yeah. Yeah. What is it, 12th? Yeah, 12th. And I would just ask, as, as the signature is taking place, if you could loop back when, when you get to all 36, just so I can report back to, Absolutely. Yes. to these bodies that there you go. We, we've met that. Thank you, so thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you for coming out. Okay. You're up next. So uh, that concludes the business of the Amherst School Committee tonight. Um, and I will take a motion. Mr. Dunley? Move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Okay, we have a motion to second. adjourn. We have a second. All those in favor? And we are adjourned. Okay, the next item of business for the Amherst uh, Pelham Regional School Committee is approval of the minutes of October 29th, 2019. I want people to have a chance to take a look at them and we'll see if they have any edits. I have one. Yes. It's under item number six about the transportation um, and under A, transportation, okay. the first sentence says Ms. Lancer <coughs> asked a question. I, I did not. Someone else did, but I don't know who it was. Okay. Anyone that that's that striking, that question. Uh, striking a quarter of anyone? Is that? Yes. This is a big moment between Ms. McDonald. I was just going to say, I think that was me. <laughs> okay. Yep. So that's Ms. McDonald. Uh, other, other edits? Yes. So at the end of uh, Section 5, Subcommittee Updates, mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have a hanging sentence. The Policy Subcommittee is meeting November 11th to continue the work on the policies discussed last, last week. Uh, there's no punctuation at the end, so it's not clear if the sentence was intended to be finished there or if it was just cut off. So it seems like it might be. I, I think that's the end of the sentence. It seems it like it wants to be. It yeah. seems like it wants to be. <laughs> Okay. Um, <coughs> other edits? I would actually say at the end of item four, chairs update. Um, the comment I remember making in the very last sentence uh, was actually about the fact that the person who was making the complaints was also going further and identifying personnel by name that they wish to have fired and other personnel by name that they wish to be hired in their place and that if that were public the community wouldn't be supportive. Anything further? I'll entertain a motion to approve as amended otherwise. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify raising your hand. Okay. That's uh, eight of us. Are there nays? Are there abstentions? Mr. Dunling abstains. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, moving forward on the agenda. Uh, we have committee announcements, uh, announcements from school committee members, uh, and also public comment. Are there any announcements from uh, school committee members? Seeing none. By the way, do you have that little counter? Ooh, yeah, can you that. get it? I can. It'll take me. I just have a feeling we might have some public comments. No, I should have thought of that earlier. I apologize. There's a, there's some just for people's um, patience. Uh, there's something we tend to do is to put on a timer because since we say people have up to three minutes to talk, we then have general assent that if you've been given three minutes that you can see the three minutes, we can see the three minutes. In the past, there's been sometimes some disagreement over whether we've um, counted correctly. So just hang tight for two seconds. Sure. I think go to sleep or something? Or? Uh, I think it's, yeah. it's a bummer. I'll do like 90 seconds. Okay. 90 seconds. That's half of a whole public time. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to time it. <laughs> that's, that's you, you, could, you could tease the chair's update. Uh, I could tease the chair's update. Um, the chair's update is going to continue a conversation we started last week during the chair's update around um, challenging messages that members of the staff and the community received.
That's about as much teasing as I was planning on doing. But it will, in fact, continue that. Well, it's a personal account. <laughs> it's Mike Morrison's account. It's not the Tenor account. There we are. Um, so uh, as people come forward, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just come forward to the microphone. Um, they'll, uh, you'll have up to three minutes to speak. Uh, and please identify yourself when you do. And it's funny, usually we're like, Mike's like right on top of these things. Nobody comment on, ideally you won't comment on this, right? I mean, we're, we're getting organized. Okay, cool. Anyone want to make a public comment? Please, if you do, please come forward to the microphone and offer your name and offer your comment. I won't sit here for three minutes waiting, so if anyone's feeling shy, they should um, come forward. No, people don't always like going first, but I have a feeling someone's going to have to take that pleasure if they want to speak. Okay, no one's coming forward. Um, all right, now we're going to close public comment. Again, as we've said before, there are other ways you can get a hold of us by snail mail, by email, and we welcome that. Um, so the next item, sorry for all that work, Mike. Uh, but it was we were ready. theoretically there was someone who was going to come forward. Uh, we were going to be ready for them. Uh, so superintendent's update is next. Dr. Morris. Sure. So... Uh, most, but not all of this is in the packet. I know it's a pretty thick packet today, and I'm going to keep it brief, again, because of the length of the meeting. So last Tuesday week ago today, we had uh, what I felt like was an outstanding um, all-state <coughs> professional development day. Um, the afternoon is at the schools, but the morning is a district-wide day that includes paraeducators, professional educators, administrators, um, custodial staff, food service staff, um, many different staff members. <coughs> and I want to thank Tim Sheehan, who's I'm glad stuck around for me to acknowledge his work, as well as Doreen Cunningham, a whole host of people who contributed to making the, the morning particularly uh, powerful. You can see the set of workshops um, is behind kind of the, the brief uh, information I have in here. Uh, and you can see the range of social justice offers. This is the third year in a row that we've done this similar model. Um, I think also worthy of thanks are our staff members. Most of these sessions, you'll notice, were led by uh, current staff members, um, so we do have some folks come in from the outside, uh, but the majority are uh, colleagues of the people taking these particular courses. Um, we had an excellent keynote speaker, Elijah, who uh, spoke about his experience um, uh, very openly about being um, an, an immigrant, um, identifying as black, uh, being transgender, and how the intersectionality of all those has influenced his experience. Uh, he's from the Boston area, went to the Boston, um, went to public schools there, and he's a college student. He spoke last year at the Mass Glisten Conference, which was here, so he was familiar with the high school version, so he was uh, familiar with the area a bit, uh, but was able to talk about um, what made a difference for him, both positively and negatively, about his experience. And we then he then led some breakout sessions that were more uh, smaller groups so that there was a lot more interaction uh, we titled them Transgender 101 and 201. Um, but you can see the range of offerings was outstanding. I was able to pop into just about every one of these. There were some that were in a circle format where walking in the middle was, would have ruined kind of the nature of the session. Um, and I think as noted, the respondents rated the morning session at a, a one to five scale with five being high and one being low as a 4.4, uh, which is a, a pretty high rating for professional development more generally. And I think it was because of the direct impact on students. So. Thanks to all who, who worked on that, and I was just glad to be a part of it. Uh, one, a couple more updates. One is um, just athletics. Just the, I know we had the steward here, but just want to continue to update you that our, our, we've had an incredibly successful fall season. Girls cross country won Western Massachusetts championships. Uh, we have the boys soccer tomorrow night in very frigid weather, but they will still play soccer. Um, <laughs> feel for them. I think it's going to be like 18 degrees or something at game time because it's in the evening. Um, uh, in the Western Mass semifinals against Ludlow, um, they're the second ranked team in Western Massachusetts. And on Saturday, the boys football team will be in the West, their, their, cup, their division championship against one Springfield. So um, there are many other sports that have had banner seasons. I just want to highlight those three. 
but really, really phenomenal outcome. So thanks to all the coaches, Ms. Stewart, Mr. Jones, and, and primarily the student athletes uh, who are involved. I also want to give uh, some somewhat brief update um, something about something that happened last year. So last week, the district sent out a release of, um, with information about an incident that occurred last spring with the boys' ultimate Frisbee team, or ultimate team, excuse me. And, and I wanted to update the committee and the community because some reporting in the local media has come out. So I thought it was worthwhile to share more details um, than perhaps that statement had. So last spring, a report came to us about an incident that occurred in an off-campus party that involved students from the boys' high school ultimate team. And the report centered around the actions of students in attempting to face jerseys of a rival team. In doing so, uh, the reports indicated that the team members made very poor decisions throughout that evening. Given the reports, the school and district staff members uh, began investigating. They offered interviews to all students who were reported to be at the party and or participated in this action. At the same time, the high school also contacted the police department, the DA's office, uh, and DCF so that the independent investigations could occur parallel to the district's process. This is standard operating protocol. Uh, I want to be really clear about that. When we receive reports that are reportable, our obligation is to report them, and, and very frankly, other agencies do their own independent investigations that are really different than what we do. Uh, and, and they're not particularly by coordinated. I mean, we're not communicating back and forth often because we're not a law enforcement agency. They're looking with very different lens on how they do it and they're gonna approach it very differently. After uh, their investigation, the Amherst police let us know that no crime, sexual or otherwise, had been committed from their viewpoint and, in, and from, excuse me, as a result of their investigation and from their viewpoint, the case was closed. So they communicated that as the district's and the school's investigation was ongoing. The school's investigation found significant conduct unbecoming of student athletes. After all of the investigations were complete, the school significantly, the school, the high school took significant actions based on this conduct. These actions included reducing significantly the 2020 season for the boys' ultimate team, eliminating the ability for recently graduated students involved in the incident to connect and be partnering with the current team, and mandating a program that will occur this spring in lieu of the missed tournaments because of the shortened season to ensure that the culture of the team is positive, that the accountability is enforced, and that restoration of relationships between players, coaches, and families is achieved. It's worth noting that these consequences were greater than any other Amherst Regional High School athletic team has faced in recent memory because of the conduct that was discovered as a result of the investigation. As a side note, there was a headline last week on Mass Live that wrote an article about that that was factually incorrect. It stated that in students at our high school were disciplined following hazing of an unconscious student. The schools nor the police's investigation found evidence consistent with this claim. After discussions with the newspaper, which I greatly appreciate in the last couple days, they've edited the title of the article to be consistent with the finding of those, the investigations that occurred from both the police department and the district. And so I think in, to summarize, um, I, I compliment the high school for the way they approached the investigation. Um, they approached it with authenticity to understand, try to understand what happened. I think the police, you know, as far as I can tell, and I'm not an evaluator of their investigation, but they did their due diligence and they reported to us their findings. And I think while it was a significant consequence, it was consistent with kind of the evidence that the high school found in their investigation. And uh, I think it's important to bring up, particularly as the Mass Live article had some, around, had the title itself was error in facts. Um, so I wanted to bring that here because I know it's been the topic of discussion, particularly as that article, since that article came out, uh, of what happened. I will say that this has been a challenge for us at the district because we generally frown on sharing information about student misconduct or consequences with the public because our main focus is on student privacy. And our goal is for students to be, even if students make mistakes and students made mistakes in this instance, uh, that we're supporting them to learn from those mistakes. And so I know that one, one or two people have inquired, why didn't we publicize this this spring? And we generally aren't in the business of publicizing student misconduct and consequences for that reason exactly. Uh, given the reporting in a public newspaper of this, a uh, couple of public newspapers, but particularly one, and, and the Mass Live reporter, in fairness, she knows exactly what I'm saying tonight. I, 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 there's no, um, there's no, um, there's no mistake, <coughs> you know, I, I was communicative. <coughs> 
because I want to be fully transparent with them. They're good partners with us in general in terms of reporting our, our newspapers. This is not an attempt to dismiss or denigrate uh, a newspaper, but there was a mistake made. Um, that we, you know, I felt it was important to share this level of detail, uh, which is a little more than we typically would share because of the reporting and because of um, some of the public dialogue that's occurred. I want to really also compliment the school and the coach for taking this incredibly seriously, working over the summer um, beyond the school hours to try to restore the relationships, and that's the way we approach things in the district. Yes, there will be natural consequences for uh, behaviors and conduct that's inappropriate, and our goal is that we restore those relationships and work together so that our students and our community can come together and have the best experience possible. So I did feel like it was important, given the article, uh, articles that were published and in the press, to be able to share with the committee and the community um, kind of the snapshot again of what happened um, and the way we approached it and uh, how we're moving forward to support students, families, and the community in the future. So I think that's all I was going to share. Great. Thank you, Superintendent. And um, I'm guessing, given the, the circumstances, there is a very limited number of questions you want to entertain from any members of the committee <coughs> that want to give an opportunity to the committee that if they have anything they want to follow up on, or Lord knows if they want to know more about Professional Development Day, yeah. uh, sort of a different topic, yeah. um, they are able to do so. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for your Dr. Morris. Um, so uh, I'm sort of following on, in a way, from uh, the the item that uh, Dr. Morris just talked about. And um, last week, um, we had, was it last week? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Feels like yesterday. <laughs> uh, we, had kind of, we had a lengthy um, discussion about um, some of the emails that members of the district have been getting. Uh, I'd point out that even last week, uh, the superintendent received yet another email, this one, offering to negotiate with the superintendent from an individual of the public who was uh, suggesting that the, uh, if the boiling point had been getting high enough, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting, that uh, there's an opportunity for you to sit down and try to negotiate. It wasn't clear to me, negotiate toward what end. But I also would say that a lot of, I appreciate this, the superintendent offering two observations about um, this, this question would happen with the ultimate team. One, that for a number of very good reasons, the, the district isn't in the habit of uh, delving into broad public discussions about incidents involve our students. Um, and and uh, one, um, and that two, uh, you cooperated fully with the district attorney and with the uh, police department and they concluded their investigation uh, seemingly appropriately, but the point is it's their job to do it, and you didn't impede them in doing so. The intersection, but the intersection, excuse me, between these two topics is that the same person, uh, who uh, Chrissy Ryan, who was uh, pushing uh, the uh, emails on a number of staff members, is also the same person who, through a, an independent website, has been flogging the story um, that all sorts of wrongdoings were happening related to uh, not just the incident, but particularly the management or handling of it or questions of any particular undue influence or behavior by anybody. Uh, and so I'm just pointing that out because I think there's an intersection between the kind of harassment we're talking about or bullying that we're talking about previously, and of which I said there are many more examples, uh, and the way in which this, this other incident was discussed, including the way in which it came to be handled uh, in the media and reported in the media in ways that, as uh, Dr. Morris just pointed out, were fundamentally inaccurate in terms of what actually occurred. Um, and uh, and, and I, th I don't know how that intersects with the offer to negotiate with you, but um, really, to me, I would, I would offer to people to take this thing as one piece um, I'm particularly bothered by this. Um, I'm bothered by this on every level. I think I hopefully made that very clear uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and lots of people have been targeted by um, Ms. Ryan or by others. <coughs> and it's been very painful and very difficult and very challenging. Um, 
uh, for me, I'm not psyched about the fact that I was um, the target of some of these comments this past week. And because it was on Facebook, um, I feel the need to respond to it. So uh, this past, and, I, and by the way, it was also in my duties as chair. So in an odd way, um, the attack actually intersects with the chair's report. What happened to the chair last week when there wasn't at a meeting? This happened at the report last week. Um, a former member of the committee, Vera Dwamini Cage, um, posted on Facebook about the ultimate um, incident and allegations that it was mishandled. And in the course of this, of which luckily for me, I was tagged in it, so I actually have a copy of the post that I was able to print out afterwards, regardless of whether it's still on. And in it, there is a section that has quotation marks around it, so I don't know, it's not attributed to anyone, so I'm attributing it to Ms. Cage. Uh, if it tracks back to Ms. Ryan's website, I haven't looked. And it says, Superintendent Michael Morris, Amherst Poland Regional School Committee Chair Eric Nakajima, Amherst Police Chief Scott Livingston, and Northwestern District Attorney David Sullivan are great examples of white men upholding the underpinnings of rape culture and white privilege by not effectively coming uh, and decisively coming to defense of a defenseless inebriated child. Um, so there's, a, there's an enormous amount wrong with that statement, and Dr. Morris uh, uh, covered most of it a moment ago uh, substantively in terms of the fact of the incident. Um, just for my own sake, I'd point out that I'm not actually a decision maker uh, or involved in any aspect of the investigation or the decision making around how this incident is pursued either by the police or by the district. And so I'm, 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 I'll leave it to Dr. Morris or others to defend their own reputations, but I'm profoundly offended that anyone would think, uh, especially uh, entirely unsubstantiated, that I would support a culture of sexual assault or rape or violence towards anybody. And it's profoundly offensive to me. Um, curiously, Ms. Dwamini Cage is actually a commissioner, in fact, treasurer, of the Asian American Commission, which is an official state body, I believe administratively housed within the, the office of the treasurer, uh, which has the mission of supporting and advancing uh, the interests of Asian American <coughs> residents of our community. Therefore, to me, it's profoundly ironic uh, and extraordinarily disappointing that Ms. Dwamini Cage, in that quote that she propagated on Facebook, um, also referred to me as white. I mean, I imagine white privilege could probably be transferred as a sort of Marxian class analysis around advantage, and I don't really care. I don't give a damn. Uh, the reality is, when my parents got married, uh, it was illegal for them to be married in states around which they lived as a young couple. Um, when I was growing up, including here in Amherst, being a minority was a ch profoundly challenging thing to be, and being a biracial minority, being somebody who is in fact half European and half Japanese American in terms of ethnic background, was profoundly isolating. Because if anyone has any memory, if they're around back then, um, America's pretty racist now, but it was very racist in terms of its social practices mm -hmm. back then. And being um, on the early edge of being a biracial child and a product of a biracial couple was an extraordinarily isolating experience. Most people would eradicate and deny my European-American background and ask me when I came to this country. They would only see my dad in me, who I'm profoundly proud of. But honestly, in a community in which you looked around and you saw Catholics and Lutherans and Irish Americans, it's hard, it, I mean, for people that don't remember it or don't know, or too young, it's hard to exaggerate how tribalized and balkanized our, our society was back then, including here in Amherst. And I will tell you, as somebody who didn't belong in any group and wasn't accepted fully in any group, it was, it was personally wounding. So to see a commissioner on the Asian American Commission for the state choosing to eradicate and deny my heritage, eradicate and deny me, eradicate and deny my parents, is one of the most profoundly vile things that I've experienced. I think I'm owed an apology for it, but more importantly, 
I honestly think that when we're, when we're coming together as a group, when we're coming together to try to figure out how we serve the students of this district in the best way possible, there's an under, in the staff, helping all of you do your work, there's an underpinning of decency. There are norms of civility and reciprocity, of empathy, that are required to do our work because everything is difficult, nothing is easy, and every argument poses more challenges. If we cannot find that decency within us and find the tools of communication to reach out to people who are different than us, to people whose experience we don't know and we can't touch, then as adults in particular from this room, we will never be able to advance our district in the way that every child and every family deserves. That's what this is about. When we talk about the incivility, when we talk about the harassment, we are not simply talking. We are talking in a microcosm about people having a hard time getting up and going to work and doing what they do. But in a broader sense, it impedes our ability to work as a team, to overcome differences, to find solutions, and serve the people of this community and the children of our districts. So that's it. Uh, subcommittee updates. Any subcommittee updates? Is there Dennis? Um, just a quick one to say that I have uh, offered the chair um, of this committee as well as the chair of the Amherst Media Board or the president of the Amherst Media Board uh, my resignation and uh, effective immediately have uh, stepped down from the board of Amherst Media um, due in large part to something that Mr. Nakajima just talked about a moment ago and Dr. Morris also talked about recently. I won't go into any details over this meeting. I don't think it bears uh, repeating necessarily, um, but I am very disappointed uh, in the direction of uh, some of our community members and feel that I can't in good conscience continue on that board um, given some of the things that I've heard. So just wanted to share that with this committee. Thanks, any other subcommittee updates? Normally I'm the one who lightens the mood, by the way, at the meeting, so I'm not even gonna do that right now, so I apologize. Um, okay, uh, new and continuing business. Uh, policy GICFB, second reading and possible vote. Ms. McDonald? Um, so I skipped the uh, subcommittee update because we're diving right into sure. our, <laughs> our work, but um, the policy subcommittee met yesterday evening um, to review this. When we read um, GICFB, which is our anti bullying po policy, at the region meeting two weeks ago, um, we had no notes or comment, and um, nobody's contacted us since then. Um, so we actually didn't make any further revisions to the policy since the last time, since our first reading. Um, and just a reminder for everybody that this this um, anti-bullying policy is being updated based on changes to Mass General Law, um, and <coughs> no other changes have been made. So these the changes in here were based on recommendation from council. And as a reminder, because it's not clear in this printout where the change was, it's under retaliation. Mm -hmm. um, the second paragraph that begins with consistent with MGO, et cetera. Um, just that paragraph is new. Um, and I believe that was the only change. Right. Are there uh, questions about the policy or any comments? Just give you a pause. Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. I need, I need a motion. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, just read, read out what it's about or something. Let's move if you on. Want. That's all. <laughs> yeah. uh, are you moving, I'm moving to the approval of, of policy JIC? I, I, move, I move to accept, to vote to approve uh, <laughs> policy JICFB. Um, so moved by Fonch. Is there a second? Second. Second by Stancer. Um, Yes. Mr. Just one minor edit um, under the paragraph for retaliation. That new paragraph that was that was changed there. 
the last sentence uh, that reads, uh, begins that, that uh, line, orientation, mental, physical development, or sensory disability, or by association with a person who has one or more of these characteristics. I was just wondering if we could spell out the, the number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just okay. easier to read that way. Okay. It's accepted as a friendly amendment, I assume. Yes. So the mover yes. and the seconder? Yes. It apparently is. Thank you. Uh, anything further? Seeing nothing, all those in favor, um, signify on by raising your hands. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. It's done. Moving on, um, I we, we discussed at length the um, <coughs> pending new policy, anti-harassment policy, um, at our committee meeting, subcommittee meeting last night, um, and hot off the presses, but not in our packet. We've got new feedback from the council um, that I I won't um, read in its entirety, um, but I'll talk to. So, in the packets, um, the advice from um, council to the Pelham School Committee um, on the policy that they've drafted was to build in a distinction and separation between harassment that is of protected classes and is legally um, uh, outlawed. Um, and then separately, the higher standard, which is what we're aiming to build into our policy, have that as either a separate policy or a separate section within the the overarching anti-harassment policy. So this version that's in our packets um, is that revision that has that sort of higher standard um, as, as um, they phrased it is bad behavior but not illegal behavior um, is, is what is in that section B. What I've done here is you'll see the, um, the lines in the left margin are the new content that was added since the version that we reviewed two weeks ago. Um, I think we talked about two weeks ago that we wanted, we, that there was a question about spelling out some examples of conduct versus just leaving it as a definition. That was also advice of counsel and that is now in this version of it. Um, and the reporting of prohibited conduct was also cleaned up a little bit to make it not as repetitive as it was in the original version. Um, so places where the action, the reporting was the same for different situations, they combined that. So again, that's in, um, marked in the left margin. Um, and then there was an important ad right before, on the third page, right before section B, um, the statement about each employee is personally responsible for um, the, um, ensuring that their conduct is not, is not harassing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, again, added. Okay. What's, um, and I'll try to, I'll read some of, I skim this really quickly to see what were the key differences in this, literally that I received at 5.30 tonight, um, from what's in our packet. And it really comes to that definition <laughs> of harassment. So we talked at our last meeting about that definition on page one, in the middle of the page, under prohibited conduct, that says a hostile environment under the policy is one in which the victim subjectively views the conduct as harassment and the conduct is objectively seen severe or pervasive enough that a reasonable person would agree that it is harassment. And so Mark Terry's um, concern was on that reasonable person, which notably is, is part of what we actually liked about that statement. Um, <coughs> but his concern is that we would be pitting ourselves against people and saying that they're actually unreasonable. Okay. Um, so he, his new version, marked up version, um, has more specificity around a definition of harassment that eliminates that reasonableness, um, but leaves it more, so I can read at least one sentence that I thought that was, um, harassment on the basis of a protected class is a form of behavior that adversely affects the employment and or educational environment. State and federal law prohibit such behavior. The district condemns and prohibits such unlawful behavior. Um, and then continues and lists that, that um, the types of behavior that would be um, sort of included but not limited to um, definitions of harassment. So I think for tonight, just uh, like, 
have conversation on the revision that we have here in our packet um, and know that between now and the next policy subcommittee meeting, which is December 3rd um, at 530, um, we will continue to work with um, both Pelham and Mark Terry to sort of round out this definition of harassment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what it will come to is a decision by us about as long as we are sort of within law, but maybe uncomfortably beyond that in terms of our higher level, but still sort of within law, is that where we as a committee want to go, or do we want to stick narrowly to precise, the precise language that, the, that our attorney has given us? Are there? I'll look to Stephen or Carrie if you want to add anything. No. no. <laughs> That's a lot to chew on. Yes, it is. <laughs> the um, <coughs> you have your hand up. Yes. Cool. Quick question. Mm -hmm. So uh, under the uh, proposed revi uh, revised language from the from the attorney, I thought I heard you say something in reference to protected class. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, I was, I was curious about that because I think that one of the reasons why the language that we currently have here in this version uh, was uh, being so seriously considered was because it wasn't just specifically about protected classes, right? It was a, right. a much more broad, you know, uh, net, if you will, so that it could cover all staff and you know students and not just those who would technically fall under protected classes. Correct. And that that is exactly so we've separated out section right. A is just the protected class harassment and then section B the higher standard of conduct includes other um, sort of non-protected classes. Okay. So so that's I, I guess I'm sorry. Uh, my question wasn't very well formulated, but I guess the I'm looking for a uh, reflection of this language that was currently in this section uh, to be in section B, so that there okay. is that broad level of protection afforded to you know, all staff, all students, regardless of whether they're, not in, they're in protected class. Does that make sense? So. Meaning the definition of prohibited conduct. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Well, yeah, and I think the, the challenge um, the challenge of it is the question of it, are, are parts A and parts B viewed as being severable in the sense that, that you, have, you have A, which is bounded within A, mm -hmm. and then B, this higher standard, is sort of a note off to itself. Because if it is, then it means that there's sort of an unde not, not terribly well-defined sidebar that says um, we're going we're, we we're to have clear guidelines to protect protected classes, but then when we're dealing with exactly the kind of conduct we're talking about <coughs> more generally right now, um, we're sort of asking for a higher standard, but we're not actually giving guidance on what the policy would be. Exactly. Is that building off of your thought? Absolutely. Okay. Cool. That's fun. Uh, any, anyone else? See, I told you it was so, fun here. Uh, anyone else have other, other can comments? Can I just yes, please. restate what I'm hearing? Yes. So there's a desire to add in that sort of level of specificity of defining harassing conduct in section B as well as in section A. Is that what? From my perspective, yes. yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes, I would agree. Are there other, are there other, um, I mean, I guess we're gonna get another read. Are there other mm -hmm. comments or feedback? Dr. Morris? I'll just share, it's not feedback on specific language, but something I shared in Pelham as well last Thursday that I know uh, increasingly I'm getting um, inquiries from staff, and, and I want to be explicit, I'm not talking about administrative staff on this policy and, and where it is and, and where things are going. Um, and and I, I told some people this morning that I would be clear to share that uh, for our teachers and our staff members, they are feeling like a policy such as the one that's being debated will be a significant statement to them about the commitments of the district to ensure their uh, in a work environment that it that ensures their well-being. I'm not saying this very clearly. I apologize, but um, and so I think they're really what I heard was really appreciative of the work, and they also want to get to you'd know, like to see a place in the near future where there's affirmative statements made via policy 
about their right to come into work and feel like their well-being is is taken care of. And it's not that they every we're always going to make every staff member happy, right? It's not it's not that kind <coughs> of thing, but just a protection against harassment and that many staff members are feeling. It's really important to them, and so I just wanted to share kind of. Uh, based on my conversations, that people are tracking this very closely and very interested to see what the result is, um, both not, not as much in, perhaps in the details that the committee's talking about, but as a more general statement towards staff members who work in the district, what can we guarantee them um, a workplace free of? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to communicate that. <coughs> I wish I was more articulate, but that's where I am. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if we're, we think we're on a track. We might still be able to bring this back for a, a read and a vote. At our next meeting? I would think so. I mean, we'll know better. Um, we'll know better <coughs> in um, once we, as a subcommittee, have been able to go through the the recommendations from the latest recommendations from council. I'm talking also very, um, with uh, Ms. Hall from Pelham mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we're in sync and, and thinking about things, and not that we have to have the identically worded policy, but to to um, share learnings back and forth. So mm -hmm. I Good. think I, th I think we can tentatively plan for that, okay. and we'll know more after the I think, I think one of the key things, and this may be in the coordination between you, Ms. Hall, and, and Mark Terry, is making sure we can get a f what might otherwise be called a final version um, yeah. out to the committee early enough that they can they can really read through it thoroughly before we get to the meeting. Shmina? The sooner the better. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because then we'll really be able to yeah. Right. Uh, and actually, you, you have a meeting set on December third. December third. So. So even cooler, because if you get yeah. it back even sooner, yeah, then we can, you know, people can show up to that meeting and give you Correct. feedback. Uh, okay, I guess we'll move on. Um, we, we have like an incredibly long agenda. Yeah. <laughs> For those people who are like watching a football game and you're like, how many hours is this thing? We're like, we're barely to halftime. <laughs> like, you know. um, although I think I think a lot of the more. Um, um, Weighty discussions might actually be done at this point. Uh, next, new and continuing business, close region revolving funds. What am I talking about? This is like the coolest <laughs> item we have. Swing <laughs> <laughs> up. Hello, how are you? Sean Nagano, Director of Finance. Um, so this is one of my first topics tonight, um, close region re revolving funds. Uh, quick recap of what revolving funds are. They're um, special purpose funds that bring in money for a particular purpose, such as athletics or food services, um, and they carry over from year to year. So if they earn any money after you take out the expenses, those balances carry over. And so we have a number of them at the region. You guys watching everybody leave behind me? Is that what you're doing? I'm looking at you. OK, just making sure. <laughs> All right, yeah, they did. Okay. Um, trying to lighten the mood. So. Um, so we have a few in the region that have um, balances that they've either been inactive for a couple years or we've eliminated the program, so I don't anticipate that those balances will be used. And so what we do in that circumstance is you take a vote and you close them out to the general fund, and then eventually they go into our E&D. Um, so the money doesn't disappear, just gets closed out to where you can then appropriate it for something else in the future. So the three specific funds... In this case, are in your packet. Uh, the first one is something that's been there forever that I don't really know what the original where the original source of funds came from, but hasn't been used in many years. And it's a revolving fund called Gifts Student Assistance. Um, it was probably set up with a, a very good purpose at one point, but now we have gift funds that have sort of replaced that. Um, and this fund hasn't been used or re requested in, in several years. Um, the second one is our insurance revolving fund. So when we have insurance claims, the claim money goes into a fund, and then we use that money to repair, replace, whatever um, whatever the insurance claim was for. Um, and there must have been a few claims going back several years that the full amount of the money wasn't used for whatever it was, and so there's a residual balance there. And then the last one is child study revolving, and that was the um, preschool program at the, high, at the high school that is where Summit Academy currently is. Um, and so the total of those three funds is $10,349.17 um, that I would ask you to vote to close out. Okay. Are there questions? From the, just to let you know, for those people who haven't maybe skipped off the front page, on item 6C, there's also a motion listed. 
um, for, for somebody to read at some point. But are there any questions from committee members? <laughs> Ms. Hanser. What happens to this money? So when you vote, this money mm -hmm. will go into the region's general fund or revenue, miscellaneous revenue, and then it'll be beyond what we budgeted for this year because we weren't planning on this. Um, and so at the end of the year, we'll go into excess and deficiency, which is the region's reserve fund. Okay, yeah. thank you. And again, so then when we do the budget process, you can appropriate from there. Anyone want to read a motion? I move uh, to transfer balances of inactive revolving funds uh, in the attached list to the general fund as described and presented by our finance director. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded as um, Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. So the second item I have tonight is the rescinding of unused debt authorizations. Um, and this one, I'm... Um, actually going to ask you not to vote. Sorry, Mike, I didn't fill you in on this before, but um, I think it's good to fill you in on, but I talk, we spoke with our financial advisor um, on either, I think it was Friday afternoon um, after this was already prepared, and she actually advised that it's something that we do eventually, but we wait until these, um, these bond anticipation notes are completely repaid before you rescind the debt. But I will give you a quick summary of what this is. So whenever you authorize debt for our capital plans, the total amount that you authorize is an official thing. It's our authorized debt. Um, when we go to do the projects, we don't always use all of it because it was an estimate of what we thought we would need. And many times, it's sort of the higher end of what we thought we would need. And so when we borrow less, the difference between what you authorize and what we borrowed is authorized but unissued debt. And it's a number that we have to report to the DOR every year when we do our debt statements. And at some point, you should go, the, the district should go in and rescind that authorized but unissued debt um, to kind of clean our books up. And basically all these projects that I would have had you do that tonight for are all projects that are completed. Um, what's going on back there? Um, and they're all completed, but we haven't finished paying the, the note back. And so our financial advisor has asked that we, that has recommended that we wait until we pay that back. A somewhat silly question, if it's authorized, could you use the debt and spend it on something? Well, we can only spend it on what was the purpose of what you authorized it for. So when you authorize the debt, you authorize it for specific projects. And so I'm it's only for those specific projects. trying to look projects. for operating funds somewhere. Yes. Not in this case. <laughs> 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 so again, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. But um, in the, you'll see in the summary sheet, that's a snapshot <coughs> of one of the reports we filed with the state. And so you can see the three highlighted ones are the ones that eventually we'll bring back to you to rescind. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, what about authorization of stabilization funds? Different agenda item, but different, unre um, unrelated in some ways. Yeah, and not appearing on our agenda. Mm -hmm. It's not. No. And then I guess it's uh, item I. Stabilization oh. funds. Oh! It's a How really long dear. agenda. <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny because in our packet it comes next. Well, because there's not handouts for the things in between. It's more, those are more discussion items. But for now on, I'll put a little. The capital plans in between. I'm, I'm not dissing how this is organized. I'm yeah. <laughs> going to stop now. I can't argue with it. So. I just have a sort of a related question. Yeah. It's not directly related to uh, unissued debt uh, authorization, but I guess it, along similar lines, I've heard from community members uh, questions in the past about if we authorize, let's say, a operational expense, a, you know, a, a line item for a new position. Mm -hmm and that position doesn't materialize for whatever reason, um, what happens to that money that was authorized for that? Does it get reabsorbed into the general fund or does it go someplace else? Yeah. It seems like we, you know, we have this protocol for uh, approving debt, right. if, so to speak, mm -hmm. to, the, to the district that isn't used, but I would assume that you know, operational expenses are sort of following the same model. Yeah, they're, they're a little different. So it's part of the general fund budget that you vote. Um, so if a new position is approved but we can't find someone to fill it and it stays empty the whole year, either the money will stay in that line item and if it's unspent, then again, it would close out to our reserve fund or the funds, if there's a decision made at some point that we're not going to be able to find somebody for this, we have another need somewhere else in the operating budget, it can be transferred to that other purpose. Um, so if you remember last year, we did some transfers from payroll to different sort, some different places. Um, that would be an example of how it would be done. 
Um, so we have a couple positions like that that we're still actively trying mm -hmm. to fill, but if at a certain point we decide we can't fill it, um, either those funds can be there to offset other areas in payroll that we are over budget and they can just kind of be there to offset it. Or if we want to transfer out of payroll, we would bring that request to you all as part of the quarterly budget report. Okay. Thank you. Can I, ask, can I ask you to clarify another common, I think, public mm -hmm. misconception? Uh, when you're talking about um, rescinding debt authorizations, oftentimes I've heard people say, hey, well, if we didn't spend, and I'm asking a different question than whether it was authorized. If we um, didn't spend a half million dollars on the roof, then I can't believe you're sitting on that money. We should use it for something else. Right. And am I wrong to say that for the capital programs, um, it isn't like we borrow a ton of money, right. whatever's authorized, have it sitting in like suitcases in a drawer somewhere <laughs> or in a bank, and then spend it when we feel we, right. we want to. I'm being too glib. I don't mean we feel like no, it. Okay. But the but the point is, if if, it, if it's never used, it's never actually borrowed. Right. No, that's right? exactly right. That's actually a common misconception um, mm -hmm. with the town of Amherst, JCPC as well, when they see big projects. Um, if it's a borrowing, which most of our capital projects are borrowings, we typically borrow once we know the exact cost of the project. And it's actually related to one of the next agenda items that you'll come up to when we have to amend one of our debt authorizations. Um, but we only borrow for once we know what the price is going to be. Um, so we don't have a bunch of excess borrowings because we don't want to pay the interest, quite frankly. You don't want, once you borrow it, you're starting to pay interest on that. Um, and so you don't want to do that. So each so. project is new, not only for the authorizations, but also because you're fitting out a, a borrowing capacity. And right. All the rest of that kind of stuff. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Let's move on. Where do you want to go? Uh, my choice. Uh, let's do the next one, which is capital plan review. Okay. So, um, Dr. Morris, um, Mr. Will Clark, the facility director, and I have taken um, put together a first draft of this. I'm sorry. My, There's my. a little too cross talk on our I'm part. Sorry. That's all right. Even on the chair. I've got this. Spotting the <laughs> and so the first, uh, <laughs> the first page in your capital plan is sort of the summary sheet. Um, so the total draft request at this point is for $497,000. And I'll go through what's included in that number. Um, $357,000 is for building type projects and $140,000 for grounds. And of that amount below, you'll see how we propose to finance it. So 450000 would be from borrowings, like we just discussed, upon anticipation notes. And then 47000 would be from special revenue funds, which I'll explain more about that. Go to the next page. This is our 10-year capital plan. I'm going to focus on FY21, but if you have questions on anywhere on here. Um, the first project we're proposing is replacement of exhaust fans for B, C, D, and E wings. These are fans that pull air from the building so that the fresh air can come in and it's sort of a cycle of fresh air. Um, at least wings B, C, and D are the main wings where a lot of the classrooms are in the high school, this, this building. Um, wasn't quite sure where wing E is, but Dr. Morris might know, I'm not sure. You say that, I wing E, I'm not sure where that is in the high school. If that's <coughs> I think that's on the far end. Far. So yeah. um, this project's been on the plan for quite a while and this is just the year that it came up. The next one is a newer project, Air Conditioning of Summit Academy and PIP. Um, so this, these are both programs that have summer programs, so they're here in July and August. Um, both are newer spaces that were designed with um, maybe with air conditioning in mind, but the air conditioning wasn't ever put in. Um, and so this money would go to find some sort of air conditioning solution for these two programs. Um, both are special education programs. Uh, the next one is, is a new project as well that we sort of have accelerated a little bit, and that's girls' locker room renovation. So we've had a large girls' locker room project on the plan for a while. Um, we chipped away at some of that this past year with um, new lockers in a section and some painting. And what we want to do is actually now get a designer to come in and help us get a cost estimate for what the rest of the project's going to maybe come in at. Um, and that's going to be replacing the showers and, and other part, like more structural um, improvements to the girls' locker room. And we want to get a better cost estimate for that. So. This money would come in to help us sort of come up with a plan and estimate the cost. Um, so, um, yeah. How do I read that it looks like you're scheduling this project, like you're doing the design now, or next year, mm -hmm. and then you're booking the actual renovation in FY26? Right. So that's FY26 is where that plan, that project has been. What our thought is, and, and we can discuss this as we formulate the plan, is that was sort of a really broad estimate when it was first developed. 
and we want to get a more specific design and proposal so that if it comes in less expensive, maybe we can accelerate that um, and move it uh, closer to where we are today. Um, so the first, again, that could move up but until we come up with a plan and know exactly what that cost estimate is, um, we're not quite sure where we would move it up to. But we, it's going to stay on the plan. Okay. So no more leaks? I know you have questions. That's why I like <laughs> um, I don't know about leaks. I hope not. I don't know. Um, so that's at the high school building. Um, we'll go to the middle school. Um, $10,000 for pool infrastructure improvements. Again, this would be, um, this comes from the pool revolving fund that you recently looked at all the license um, information on. It's going to bring in some more money this year. And that money would go to help uh, maintain the infrastructure of the pool. Um, one of the things we want to put in there is like a more advanced management system of chemicals so the DPW can monitor them remotely and be more responsive to when we need to put more chemicals in the pool. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some other infrastructure improvements we need to make. And then the next one is $100,000 for the AC chillers at the middle school. So the chillers at the middle school are actually older than the chillers that you've heard about at um, Fort River and Wildwood. Um, we've had better luck with them. As far as I know, there haven't been any major issues, um, but they're getting to that point. So this work would be partially engineering work. It would also be to look at if there's other things we can do to those chillers to extend their life into the future. And if, if I could add, just one of the things we're noticing now with the life of them is that it works really differently in different parts of the building, mm -hmm. which is a huge it's sense forward. of, uh, a huge source of frustration, understandably, so that you'll go in some rooms, and, you know, on a hot day, they're still, it's brisk, you know, and other rooms that are literally two doors down and they're incredibly uncomfortable and not great learning spaces when it's hot. And, and I think when you have chillers in a building that's this old without major renovation, this kind of thing happens. And it's trying to address the variability that we see upstairs, where in the most of the middle school classrooms, vast majority are upstairs. And um, it's literally walking one room to the next. You'll, you'll, it feels like a different climate zone, and, and we need to address that. Mm -hmm. The Mr. next. Oh, Just a question Is the high school air conditioned? Not partially, yeah, partially. Yeah. There's not like a single air conditioning system for the high school. I think are, there's are classrooms right. air conditioned. Most partially. of them are not, right? It depends on Where which classroom you are. So the because I was the teacher, and when it got hot in the room, learning stopped. Yeah. So there are some rooms that are, and some rooms that are not. It depends what floor you're on and what section of the building. Okay. Um, the next three or four are all district-wide projects. So. Um, and the three of the next three are new. So solar PV design study. So we've been talking a lot about solar on the middle school roof, um, parking lot canopies at the high school. And what we thought is it may be time to have a more comprehensive design or a proposal with an expert around solar and what we should be considering. Um, we also wanted to consider maybe ground mounted solar at the middle school as opposed to roof mounted solar because of the cost of the roof mounted solar. And so we wanted to um, at least start um, some sort of um, feasibility, exploratory um, type study with somebody who's an expert in that to give us some options um, and maybe point us in the right direction because there's a lot of different streams and trying to coordinate those streams um, so we're heading the right way. ADA improvements, we had an ADA study and so in response to the ADA study we should now put have some ongoing amount to address some of those things um, and there may be bigger projects that come up at some point but <coughs> we wanted to get on the plan for now at least a baseline level of funding that we're going to use to address um, what we can in that, in that study. Asbestos abatement and management, sort of a similar thing. It's, it should have been the capital plan probably longer ago. All, you know, most buildings built in that area have some asbestos management issues, and so we wanted a, a repeating amount to, to work on those throughout the year as we go forward. And then we have two more years of the Summit Academy <coughs> debt obligation that we agreed to refund the town, FY21 and FY22. Um, it's according to a schedule that we agreed upon with them many years ago. And then at the middle school, so now we're into grounds. So at the middle school, we put $50,000 in. This is also a new one for ground improvements. Middle school um, or high school? Uh, high school. Um, we may make it district, but for right now, the focus when we talked about it was at the high school. Um, it's going to be, be just intended to do a th few things. The first one is um, when we put Summit in, we had the intent of removing the modular that's at the end of that hallway, but ran out of funding to do so. And so we might use some of that funding to finish removing that modular, which is sort of ground related because it's just kind of juts out and takes up space. Um, and then some of this money would also be used to finish landscaping around Summit Academy. So the interior work was done, but a lot of the exterior work <coughs> was not. And there's actually, you'll probably hear at some point, there's a project um, that we got a grant from a, from a <coughs> company to help do some of the landscaping design and things like that. And then the bulk or the rest of it would be used for 
um, some of the things we've heard about in the past, more grass seed, some contracted services to repair parts of the field, aerating, um, just general initiatives we can do to improve the conditions of the field on an ongoing basis. Um, after that is, so the one thing we wanted to do last year with some of the available funds that we just weren't able to do timing wise um, was address the two parking lots. So at the high school, this back end of the parking lot over there is in rough shape. And so we got a quote from the DPW through their um, paving contractor to totally tear up that back, that back road and repave it and regrade it and fix that. Um, and that would be $30,000. And we proposed that be paid for out of the parking lot revolving fund. Um, that students who pay fees, that's really what it's for, is to maintain a good parking lot for them. And then the middle school, we got a similar proposal for the, um, the, the lot for sort of district offices um, to tear up part of it that's really bad and then the rest of it seal um, and get some more life out of that parking lot because we have terrible pothole issues every year <coughs> in that parking lot um, and no major work has been done in a while. And that is it for the capital plan. Great. Are there questions? Uh, yeah, I'm going to the ADA and the asbestos. Um, are we currently uh, up to speed with the ADA requirements? So we had um, a study done this spring um, by an outside group that specializes in that. And they went through all our <coughs> buildings and sort of noted the major areas where we can make improvements. And they gave us an itemized list with some broad cost estimates. So we have a... Um, an up-to-date study of all our buildings of sort of where the concerns are. So these are improvements, they're not additions to what we already There are areas have. that are currently sort of less than we would want, right? Okay, and on asbestos, um, seeing a 10-year plan for remo removing asbestos, mm -hmm. is that how, because we have so much asbestos around? So just 20,000 doesn't actually get you very much when it comes to asbestos removal. Um, it's one of those areas where like paving roads where you're always surprised at how little you get for um, how much it costs. Um, so it's more, there's, there's th every three years there's some expensive, more broad requ reporting requirements that we have to do um, where we have to bring in an outside contractor to do some stuff with us. And then in general, there's always sort of trouble areas that we want to work on when we can during summer, dur mainly during summer is when we can tackle it um, because the building has to be cleared out. Um, so it's more of just an ongoing to address the areas that we need. Again, if we didn't have an area, we wouldn't use the money that year. Um, but my guess is at least for the, sh the short term, we would always have things to work on. Thank you. We're undoubtedly going to have another meeting at some point in the not distant future that's less financially oriented and more sort of capital planning oriented. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great in that meeting to have some kind of discussion about what we're talking about more specifically, mm -hmm. just because I think whenever you use the words asbestos, or frankly for that matter, ADA, mm -hmm. <laughs> either one that were brought up, um, there are always going to be members of the public who are like, hold on a second, what's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it would be very welcome. Yeah. I don't mean by you. I mean, no, speak, no, no, no. I'm just saying it'd be welcome. Yeah, Mr. Roy it. Clark wanted to come tonight, um, yeah. but we decided that there'd probably be a better <coughs> time where we can dive into it. No, I think the division yeah. of labor is better to go through it the way you are, and then yeah. people can get another dive in there. And eventually, this all becomes part of a narrative that does exactly what you um, just said, which has a more descriptive spe um, specificity around each project. Um, and then also, i got to double check the date, but it's coming up soon. We have a um, budget and finance subcommittee, which is focused around capital planning, where we invited some town officials to come and hear some of these, some of our um, preliminary thoughts on the capital plan and get their feedback as well. Could you remind the members of that committee when it's when the date is? Are you on that committee? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Once I double check in my own calendar that day, I will send it out to the committee, Thursday. as well as anybody else who wants to go. The 21st. Yes, that's how that runs okay. about. Dr. Morris, uh, I just wanted to note. I know we'll get to this later, but it's it's going to be late. That um, at the last meeting about athletic fields, um, there was a request for our, the district, or maybe two meetings ago, to come back uh, with a plan of how to approach the feasibility. So we'll, we'll come right. back on December 10th with that, but since we're talking capital and explicitly not talking about that, it's because we're, we're formulating a plan um, that wouldn't be on this capital plan document right now of how to get a feasibility study kick started. Okay. Mr. That was exactly my question. Thank you. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> you know, if we do it this way, everything will be okay. much more concise. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think Ms. Ardoni's wants? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at the funding sources, uh, financing, of course.
course, being what most of us turn to when we don't have excess cash in hand to pay for various projects. Uh, but the proposed $450,000 sort of sits smack in the middle of a couple of other very high amounts. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that they're not justified, but I'm just wondering how uh, your department keeps track of where we are in mm -hmm. financing for these different projects yep. and if, if there's any opportunity to consolidate some of these, you know, renegotiate, mm -hmm. um, sort of if you can just walk us through that process a little bit. Yeah, so we have a master schedule of all our projects. Um, because we're a region, we also have in that master schedule have to keep track of um, how those projects are divvied out to the towns because ultimately every project you approve for debt, we then assess to the towns as a separate capital assessment, um, separate from the operating budget that you do. Um, and so we track that out over several years. When we authorize new projects, we factor that in. Um, a couple years ago at the, the capital planning forum that we just spoke about, um, we modeled what approval of the field, pro the field mm -hmm. project would look like and what the, pro the, the impact of the roof project because we haven't seen the roof yet because we didn't get into the MSBA, but that's also a big ticket item. Um, and so the reality is it does increase the capital assessment quite a bit for the towns. Um, it's sort of at a lower point historically because we don't have any big projects right now. We're sort of doing these middle, medium-sized projects. The large renovation of the high school was paid off a couple years ago. Um, so it, it is going to be something that we're going to have to work out with the towns that if we want to maintain these buildings, which are all 1960s, 70s, um, the investment in capital is going to have to steadily increase. Um, and we try to, one thing we've been trying to do by paying off the bands as opposed to bonding for everything. In the past, we used to do bond anticipation notes and then at a certain point, we would lump it all together and do a bond. And the towns wouldn't actually pay for it until we did the bond. Mm -hmm. And what that did is we would have debt payments that would go like this, mm -hmm. and then bond and go like this, mm -hmm. and bond and go like this. <coughs> now with the bands, we can kind of keep it a little more even because we don't have any large projects in those bands. Um, so we can been able to keep it pretty steady the last few years, and at least for some of these smaller projects, we can keep doing that. Um, so our goal is to keep it level and just prepare the towns when we're going to see some of the spikes for these bigger projects. That is a very helpful explanation, Mr. Mangana. Thank you. <laughs> just very briefly, I think the other thing to note is if we look at the current year's capital plan, there was $3 million for a roof that, since we didn't get into the MSBA, we're not currently taking advantage of or uh, utilizing and so I think that'll be some ongoing conversation with the four towns when we get to the four town meeting and beyond about kind of what's the forecast on that and, mm -hmm. and what we plan to do but um, I think that's a it's a really big number that was approved that we have yet to take action on it's mm -hmm. authorized but unissued which will be important to have Mr. Sullivan girls locker room renovation yes sir how does it stand in comparison to the boys locker room renovation I'm not a facility expert. Um, in terms of timing when they were done, the boys were done first, um, just in terms of time. Um, so that's Is the, where it stands. But the boys' locker room, though, that, that's done, right? That's um, it was done, I want to say 2014-ish, um, was when it was on the capital plan. So there were all, all these projects are sort of, most of them are where they've been slotted on the capital plan for when it, since the capital plan was first created. <coughs> Um, back in around 2012 was sort of when we put the comprehensive capital plan together. Um, so we did, like, like I said before, we did invest about $15,000 in the um, girls' locker room this past spring, and that's really why I wanted to do this study is to have some cost estimates. So if, you know, if we have another good year, a budget year, if there's things we can chip away at in the spring to make immediate impacts, we can. And if there's bigger, tic bigger ticket items that we have to borrow for, we can try to accelerate those. So it's, po it's possible then the 350 figure you have there mm -hmm. I mean, first off, that could be wrong. It could right. Be a it's a, it's a, yeah. But besides that, it might that might not be the right way to look at it. It mm -hmm. might actually be like a hundred thousand or something significant, and then like four or thirty thousand dollar projects. Yeah. That you could chunk out at different points. Yep. Yeah. No. There's definitely if you know the girls' locker room, there's three sort of sections to it, and the middle section is the section we sort of addressed a little bit, um, and the first section is the section that has, needs the most work. That's where the showers are. The plumbing needs a lot of work. Um, the showers need to be made into individual showers. And then there's some removal of some really old type, like shoe type lockers or cubbies that need to be ripped out just to make it more of a, a space that can be utilized. So there's a way to do it. I mean, especially Mr. Mr. Sullivan has very helpfully brought this subject mm -hmm. up. Every, all, all the, every, the entire time I've been on the school committee, and I'm sure it's been much longer than that. Um, if there's a way to sort of dummy numbers to suggest we're actually going to move up our 
mm -hmm. investment in the girls' locker room. I think that might be nice. Yeah, absolutely. To both, both to achieve, but also then to show people that we're going to make some effort to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, again, why we bring this to you all, um, so that we can also get a sense of your priorities um, in conjunction with the facility director's sort of recommendations about what you know he sees as the highest importance. We also want to hear from you um, on those things. So. Yeah. Mr. Fox, did you have something else? Yeah, I, just quickly. Um, both the boys and the girls' locker rooms, are, have they been renovated to accommodate <coughs> trans students? Uh, that I don't know the answer to. I have to come back to you on that one. I remember a discussion about that way yes, back sir. in the day that there was there was some thinking about, and I wasn't sure if that had elevated up to we, you have to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think more of the focus has been on bathrooms, um, but that's something we can come back to. I just, I, I'm not 100% sure. Just bring, sure it, bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Write the question down and bring it back. Okay. Is there anything Is there anything else on this item from the committee right now? Because otherwise we're going to move forward. Okay, and we'll move forward. Since I have no idea what some of these are because it's apparently they're, they're numbered in different ways than the packet <laughs> says. Um, what are we on next? So this next one is actually Ms. Stancer. She's oh, going right. to report out the warrants yeah, that she signed. Right. And we also need to identify some new peril. Yes. Um, so just keep it in mind that, that, you know, sort of a work in progress. So I have gone in every Friday and signed warrants. I've coordinated that with Kathy Vassallo. And um, so I've signed three warrants, October 31st, November 1st, and November 8th. And I can give you the totals for the various big categories. So in the general fund, that's a total of $1,054,901.36. The revolving fund is $7,404. Other fund um, is $146,581.62. And the grant fund is $9,574.99. Welcome. <laughs> so, um, when you joined the committee, mm -hmm. you remember you did a declaration? I did, and that's why the second thing is on here. So, I might checked with the uh, council and determined that I cannot sign payroll warrants because sure. my son works at the middle school. Right. <coughs> so, so, someone else is going to have to do that. So, we need someone else to be who's willing to go in and sign uh, the payroll, review and sign up. Mm -hmm. and then report out on it. Are there any any volunteers to do that function? Question? Sure. Yes. Um, rather than division of labor, why do you just not have one person do all of it? I, I'm willing to, I'm willing, I don't want sure. to take your, your, your <laughs> job away from you, but I'm willing to do it. It's crazy to have two people do this. Yes. I'm, that was not an offer we anticipated. I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> It was hard enough to get Ms. Stancer to volunteer last time, so uh, is it's uh, fine with me. Do you, you mean you accept the offer? I, I accept the offer. I offered because we're generally around. You know, we don't do a lot of traveling, but at that point we didn't know this other issue. Oh, it was mm -hmm. great so, of you to do so. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, we move that the committee appoint Mr. Fonch um, to review and sign uh, warrants on behalf of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee and report back <coughs> to this committee <coughs> regularly with the results. I've just moved it. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Mr. Menino. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, All those? I would yes, make you one, do have discussion. Okay. one point, <laughs> yes. which is I would check and find out, well, I've been going every week because there have been warrants every week. I don't know if the payroll is a weekly warrant or if it's, I was wondering if it was every other week, so. Um, is Friday the best day to come in? Normally, yes. Um, this week, if it's possible to come in tomorrow or Thursday, it'd be better. We have a couple things that are happening this weekend that we um, would like to be able to pay How would earlier. I know that? I'll usually let you know. So if we have any type of expenditure where it's like a field trip where they need to check with them when they go, um, they're usually special. They don't happen all that often, they're usually special, okay. but we happen to have one this weekend. Okay, thank you. Can I, so I want to, can we vote? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, all can those. Please, I'm sorry. Yes, I please. just have a, a quick question. Yeah. And I, uh, I just, I thought I had heard at some point um, 
and, and this is, please excuse me, Mr. Fonch, but I, I just, I thought I remember uh, there being a conversation about your serving as a substitute at some point, and I'm not I'm sure. No, I no longer substitute. Okay. I just wanted to check on that. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Fonch. Thank you, Ms. Tancer. And I believe the previous motion, which designated Ms. Spitzer as, a, as an alternate, mm -hmm. is still in effect. <laughs> Next. All right, the next one is for our fast readers, whoever can do that. Um, so this is a debt authorization that um, this committee undertook um, for the FY19 capital plan, so it would have been back in 2018. And the language that was used to authorize this debt, even though these projects are already have been done, they were, most of them were done last summer, um, the Department of Revenue didn't like our language. It's the same language that they have approved for like three or four consecutive years prior, and they decided this year that they did not like the language. There was one specific <coughs> sentence that really was unrelated um, to the projects that they didn't like, and so they wouldn't therefore approve our language, and it caused us some issues with borrowing. Um, we were able to borrow still, but we want to be able to borrow the way we normally do with the DOR, um, and in order to do so, we need to amend the language to something that they will approve. And so basically there was one sentence that was struck, and I'll just tell you what that sentence is. So the, really all of our capital plan votes from FY 15, 16, <laughs> 17, 18, and, and 19 had a sentence in there that said the director of finance may allocate um, or may shift funds between projects as long as all the projects are able to be completed. Um, we had that put in because before we had that language, there was a year where we had one project come in way under budget, and we had another project come in way over budget, and we just, the project that came away over budget, we had to find money in the operating budget because we weren't able to shift the funds between the two. And it seemed silly that we had this borrowing, but we couldn't shift the, pro the, the funds. Um, and so we put that sentence in to allow us to do so, and it worked. Um, but this past year, according to the DOR, they changed their, their attorneys who sort of interpret um, you know, legal things for the department, and they decided they didn't like that sentence. And so that's what this vote is. It's amending the debt authorization vote to remove that sentence um, so that when we go out to do our rollover, our bond anticipation notes, we can do it the normal way we have always done with the Department of Revenue. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what if, if that circumstance occurred, mm -hmm. is it possible for the committee at that point to amend, to allow the, the, fund, the authorizations, to, the money to move? You mean if borrow? like we had one come in under and one come in? Yeah. Um, or are we condemning ourselves to take it out of operating? There may be a way we can do it. The problem is with any of our debt authorization votes, there's extra rules around it. So even with this one, for example, which is just an amendment, we still have to do these rules, which is mm -hmm. we have to post an advertisement within 10 days. We have to allow 60 days for our town meeting to be held, to vote up or down on it. Um, and so we might be able to do something like that, depending on how significant it was. We just would have to allow enough time for it to go through, essentially. So I put a lot of pressure to guess o high. Overestimate yeah. rather than underestimate. <laughs> yeah, and there might be ways, I mean, I talked to our financial advisor um, and bond council. Bond council, they help us draft this stuff. You know, I was a little annoyed because I felt like we try to be transparent with this and list out individual projects and what we think they're going to cost. You know, there may be a way where we just put a lump number and not list out the individual projects and what they cost. And then that way, it sort of covers all the projects and then we wouldn't have this issue. Um, again, I don't think that's necessarily as transparent as the way we've been doing where we try to, um, but there may be, my point is there may be ways to structure the vote that gives us more flexibility, but we'll make sure the DOR approves it before we bring that to you, so. Okay, so we need to do this for housekeeping to exactly. be able to do yep. our projects. Anyone feel like reading this? Anyone willing to? Oh, Mr. Dibley, thank you. Is, is this two motions, by the way, or is it just a long? It's a long, long okay. motion. Uh, I move that the district hereby amends the vote of the school committee at a meeting held on March 12, 2018 for the purpose of paying costs in the amount of $322,000 for the following projects, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto. One, building use study in the amount of $90,000. Two, roof repairs for the, for the middle school in the amount of $20,000. Three, replacement of the middle school boiler in the amount of $115,000. And four, Summit Academy relocation renovation costs in the amount of $97,000 said sum to be expended at the direction of the Regional School District School Committee. To meet this appropriation, the District Treasurer is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws and the District Agreement as amended or pursuant to any <coughs> other enabling authority. 
any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to pay such costs by a like amount. I further move that within 48 hours from the date on which this vote is adopted that the Secretary be and hereby is instructed to notify the Board of Selectmen of each of the member towns of this district in writing as to the amount and general purposes of the debt herein authorized, as required by Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws, and by the district agreement. In addition, the committee shall cause the same information to be published within 10 days after such authorization as a paid notice in a newspaper circulating in the district. Moved by Mr. Demling. Is there a second? Second. Second by Adonis. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read, signify, carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dunlop. Lunch debt gifts. Explore methods for applying donations to overdue balances and offer guidance to district staff for implementation. Yes. So we have now a donation, several donations at the region from um, a frequent um, participant in our schools, Mary Lou Barrow. Um, who has made several um, donations, um, $15 each, but I think it's over $100 now in total that she's donated. She was the first one um, to really get this started. <coughs> and so th the purpose of these donations were to offset lunch debt um, that has accrued in the district. Um, several other communities have had similar um, initiatives undertaken, and so it was really nice to get that started. And then we had a different person uh, make a donation um, in Amherst. So now in both districts we have these funds set up that have been accruing whenever, well haven't been accruing, but whenever donations are made there's a fund set up to, to store it. Um, and so the key thing is, I think it's a good thing, we should advocate, try to, this is a good thing to fundraise around, um, many communities do it. Um, but the other piece is how do we apply those donations when they come in? Um, there's different ways we could think about it. Um, I think I emailed the committee at one point a few different ways. I did reach out to um, Ms. Farrow, <coughs> just ask her what her preference was, and, and I'll fill you in on that. Um, and I don't know if you have to vote necessarily, but really just looking for sort of your general feedback on it. Um, so the three ways that I had sent out were the first way is we could apply this debt sort of proportionally, or that these funds proportionally to all the outstanding debt. Um, really low impact, because it's probably like gonna be like 15 cents a student or something, um, <laughs> and a lot of manual work, so I would not recommend that. Um, and, and Ms. Farrow agreed with that. Um, the second way is to apply to some of our highest overdue balances and sort of maybe consider where maybe the greatest need is potentially. I don't know for sure, but potentially. Um, and that would be sort of s more simpler. Um, and Ms. Farrow was okay with that option. And then the third option, and then there may be others, I'm open to others. Um, the third option was keep that fund as sort of the reserve for which families can request waivers of their balances. Right now, when we send out those overdue notices, Periodically, several times people will email back and say, you know, I'm having a financial hardship, I'd like to reduce my, um, I'm request a waiver of my overdue balance and as much, you know, some portion. And we could use that as sort of that reserve to do that. Um, if we were to do that option, which isn't a bad idea, we would um, maybe have to come up with like some sort of formal um, documentation process so that it's consistent um, going forward. And Ms. Farrell was okay with that third option as well. So sort of three different ways to think about it, and there could be other ones, and I'm looking for your thoughts on it. Do you have anything? Okay. Mr. Gallo? I, I don't know if you know this off or have this with you, but what is um, the average or typical size of overdue balances? I don't know about average, but the overall um, was in the fifty to $60,000 range if you look at K through 12 um, for all of our districts, and, and because the problem is it accumulates from the time someone's in kindergarten, potentially until they're in 12th grade, if there's no payment. Um, so some of the balances can get quite large. But um, you, I can bring back you, sort you of. You didn't mean to say individual families. No, no, not balances. individual families. In, in, in aggregate, <laughs> all students, yeah, all students. <laughs> yeah. Be some expensive I mean, even lunches. Even if that is between <laughs> second <laughs> grade and right. Be some expensive <laughs> lunches, which, yeah. Yeah. Um, So in aggregate. <laughs> but I can bring back some metrics on averages, um, if that's helpful, and sort of like high, low kind of thing. So Dennis? Um, I actually, uh, I just for what it's worth, I think that that third option uh, okay. seems to get at the, you know, the intent of something mm -hmm. like this. Um, and I think that 
I especially like the idea of offering that as a fundraising opportunity mm -hmm. for yeah. families. You know, I would imagine <coughs> some of our, our PGOs, um, you know, individuals in the community might be interested in, in fundraising <coughs> and donating to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, funds like this for both districts. Yeah. Um, I also think that uh, we might consider perhaps at some point matching some of these donations. Um, you know, even though I, I recognize that year to year that there is, you know, a significant balance that gets carried forward. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I think we've also realized that, you know, just given the research and the conversations that we've had with community members, that when parents and caregivers don't pay off their balances, it's typically because there is some severe hardship. Mm -hmm. I think either, you know, either ignorance, people don't realize that they've got so much money that they owe, uh, or, you know, sort of keep forgetting to, to do it, or because there's actual hardship. Um, and I'm more interested in the folks who are experiencing that severe hardship. Um, and again, you know, just thinking, I think, for something for the district at some point to consider is would it make both financial and educational sense for us to consider, you know, any donations that are made to these balances for the district to help mm -hmm. fund some of that or offset some of that. Um, I think it shows an incredible amount of um, empathy for families and what they're experiencing. Also helps us meet our educational outcomes, recognizing how important it is for students to have good, good nutrition, mm -hmm. especially if they don't have it at home. Um, so I know that there have been several school districts around the country that have eliminated debt completely for all students, regardless of their ability to pay, um, and become, you know, have begun uh, doing things like that to help offset <coughs> costs that, that may accumulate in the future. So even though I can't, you know, I think in good conscience, given our uh, budget and economy, recommend that we would eliminate all school debt, that's not what I'm saying, um, or lunch debt rather, um, I think it's worth exploring mm -hmm. ways that we can help mitigate some of that burden on families in our community. Yeah, I would, I would uh, agree with that sentiment. Um, I also like the, I like the idea of the waiver, the option to request a waiver <coughs> or to waive some or, or, or all the balance to be, to be a really like well known kind yeah. of process. I mean, I think, you know, the the the, the cynical way to look at this is the, like, oh, if we're really transparent and communicative that you can just request a waiver or part of your balance and people will take advantage of it. And uh, I mean, to that I would say there, there's, there's no possible way that the schools or the school committee could ever get into arbitrating whether someone is actually in need or not. And, and the, the amount of a balance is not always indi indicative of need. You can have a very small balance. It's a very large hardship. And I mean, for, for my own two cents, I, I think that ev even if that there were cases of individuals taking advantage <coughs> of the system, I think that would be a small price to pay to have a, a really transparent, open system that says, you know, now, now's the time when you, when you, you know, share that you, you may need a partial waiver, then those waivers come in. We have some amount of uh, funds that can offset that through gifts, uh, possibly through matching funds, and th those get distributed. and. You know, through through that we chunk it off. You know, and um, so, and you know, always making improvements to that kind of process. I, I, I just really like the idea of having kind of a, a really conscious, defined, structured way where the school committee, the public, and and parents are working together for a more efficient way to, to handle that. I think it's the I think it's the, um, it's a logical extension of how we restructured our food collections policy already, in which I know um, the district has been doing more um, outreach to parents and guardians uh, in trying to really engage them. But the reality is, if for some reason a uh, family, well, for the obvious reason, is that income, the family isn't deemed eligible for free lunch, then there's got to be, I mean, even if they are, they may carry a balance. I mean, the question is, what do you do with the balance? Yeah. But then, particularly if they're not, but there is some sort of felt hardship, which can easily happen. Mm -hmm. um, there ought to be some mechanism to try to be able to work with the families. And so to the extent that we don't have that now, we need it. So I think it's a great idea. Um, Ms. McDonald and then Mr. Menino. Um, so building on that, on the comments of Mr. Demling and thinking about the process, of, like, this is sort of why I asked the question about what's the average mm -hmm. balance size for a, a family because yeah. I do worry about, I think a, a process and a structure needs to be t defined ahead of time because 
um, when those invoices go out or the notices go out about an overdue balance, um, you, you don't want to make it first come first serve. And if right. the first person's balance, first person's balance eats up the entire gift versus somebody else, you might have gotten <coughs> three people's entire balances covered, right? So I think you know defining that um, is really important in making that transparent. On the flip side, I also wonder if we're started, we'd be veering um, uncomfortably into an area of picking and choosing whose balances get waived and whose doesn't. And I'm not sure we, we have the <coughs> structure to help the district decide who gets, right? So if, if, the, if the request for waivers comes in and it's larger than the balance that you have available from gifts to cover that, how do you choose? Um, so I do, I, I see you want to respond, but I, was, I, I do really like the idea of coming up with um, uh, a, a line item um, in our operating budget to cover that. And maybe that's the approach that we take is that as a, as a district, we start setting aside funds in, in our balance, in our budget every year to start chipping away. 50000 is a lot of money, but over the space of maybe yeah. five years, chipping away a little mm -hmm. bit at it, just like we do at asbestos, <coughs> it might be just as impactful. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think that's right. And I think maybe the first thing we could try to do is maybe set a goal for a certain amount to raise so that we're not, we don't want to start it when we have very little. Right, we don't right. want to get to a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And then, and while we're doing that, <coughs> formalize all these procedures that we're talking about. And then mm -hmm. we hit that goal, sort of implement once we feel like we have a safe amount where we can really honor, you know, we don't want to put it out there and then not be able to honor I, it. I don't know um, if you want to work with on this, but I think the point is the next thing to do is to come up with a real program. Sure. And it can answer all these questions, but also then comes up with a line item target. Um, who else wants to speak? So Mr. Menino and then Ms. Bitzer. I was just thinking about timing. The, the Jones Library has a uh, fine uh, waiver, what, what, uh, I can't think of the name, Overdue a fine yeah. <coughs> off they forgive this a period, like a month or something like that. You can, so everybody knows when to apply for the waiver. Mm -hmm. Well, so we, the way it's worked sort of to now, which has not been super formal, is we, every time we send out an email notification, there's a, um, there's a blurb there where people, if they have financial hardship, they can reach oh, out. Okay. Um, so we probably continue to do that with a link. Um, in terms of fundraising, another thing I was thinking of is if there's Valley Gives Day every year, this would be a good Valley Gives um, okay. initiative mm -hmm. to consider this year. Um, so I just have a very simple question. Um, and forgive me because I, I don't present at school lunch, but I do know um, when I looked into it, there's a sizable fee just to be able to kind of like preload your kids. With my school bucks, yeah. Yeah, so uh, do kids ever get a balance be based on those? Could, could that be contributing to the debt that kids are experiencing? Because that seems like kind of a... If there's any way we can reduce that fee for right. kids, uh, it just seems kind of like a yeah. So I'm not going towards something. So I typically, when people ask tangible. how they can prepay, I tell them about my school books, but I also tell them there's a fee associated with it, and they can also prepay pay by just mailing a check to the food service department, um, and then there's no fee. I mean, mm -hmm. except for postage, um, or they can send the, the money in with their student, depending on what age, you know, um, and they can prepay at the register. So they don't have to use the my school bucks where there's a fee associated with it. Um, it's an Super option. It's convenient. It just yeah, it's convenient. It's an it's, option. It's so um, expensive. You know, typically if you're putting money on your account, you're prepaying sort of the account. So in that circumstance, it wouldn't necessarily okay. be adding to debt. But you could theoretically be paying off debt, paying off an overdue balance through my school bucks as well, which in that case, you'd kind of be paying a fee in order to pay off. So again, it there's ways around it, but it It also seems like sometimes you incur a debt because you forget to send your kid into school, whereas mm -hmm. if you had the convenience of being able to prepay, you might avoid some of that mm -hmm. debt. So it just seems like, uh, yeah. just something to think about in the- Yeah, and we could try to find process. other convenient, more, maybe more convenient ways for prepaying. Again, we keep my school bucks as an option, but we, um, we don't necessarily push it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Great, and if you, it sounds like if you need- Yeah, I've got good direction. Engagement, you can contact members of the committee might be willing to help. Um, <coughs> now we go back to authorization of stable funds, utilization fund expenditure. Home stretch. So the item <laughs> that was in your packet. Yes. Um, so this is um, 
another sort of housekeeping thing, but I'll give you the background. So every year that uh, we, the district has a stabilization fund specifically set up for capital. Um, it's there as an emergency fund in case something breaks down. It can also be there to put money in in anticipation of capital expenditures. Um, two or three times now in the last few years, we've actually put money into the stabilization fund <coughs> in anticipation of the field project. We put, I think, 70000 in one year. This most recent year, we had 60000 in the budget um, to build it up. That stabilization fund is also used to pay the Summit Academy debt that was in the capital plan. That was a little revolving fund um, shading. And so that's, it's used to pay the, those payments back. And then it's also used to pay any interest on our bond anticipation notes. Um, so there's a little snapshot. There's, there's a description of what I'm asking to authorize, which is um, a maximum of $15,330.85 in interest on bond anticipation notes and $7,383 of principal and interest payments on the Summit Academy debt for a total expenditure for FY20 of $22,713.85. So that's what you'd be authorizing. The snapshot below shows you the beginning balance in that capital um, stabilization fund, the revenues that are projected to go into it, earnings on investments, and the general <coughs> fund contribution this year, those exp expenditures I just described, and then the ending balance. Um, and I say a maximum um, of fifteen thousand for the bond anticipation notes because some of these, some of the interest on these bond anticipation notes, we're actually getting debt assessments from the towns to pay, and so that won't come out of the stabilization fund. It'll just be whatever's left over. Um, so it'll be something less than that. Any questions? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <coughs> there. Yes. No. There's a motion under I. Somebody would like to offer. I move to approve FY20 expenditures from the stabilization fund as shown in the attached summary. Moved by McDonald. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ardonis. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McDonald. Okay, 2020. 20, 20. You could easily skip your words over this. 2020, 2021. School year calendar. Feel a little back to the future ish, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> so there were three options that are in the packet. They were presented, uh, developed, and uh, in collaboration with W.S. Moreland in her role, as well as Mick O'Connor, who's the president of the APEA, the Amherst Palm Educator Association. And they were shared with uh, the APEA membership as an aside, or not an aside, as a note, the APEA contract. Uh, includes that the APEA membership needs to approve any year where the start date for teachers is before September 1st. So in other words, we always have to include an option that has a start date for teachers of September 1st. It's also worth noting that this next year has the latest possible Labor Day. So it is, it looks very different than the last few years, just when Labor Day is and when <coughs> school year would start. So there were three options presented. And uh, I got feedback and met with Mr. O'Connor today. And the option, it was very narrow. Uh, usually there is an overwhelming vote, and this year was the opposite. But the second draft, which on the top says Amherst Pelham and Amherst Pelham Regional Calendar 83120 uh, draft, was the narrow victor in terms of the APEA uh, vote. They had a high number of, high turnout in terms of their votes. I typically am pretty agnostic as it relates to differences between the calendars. I want to note for the public that it is a later start of school than we've had the last couple, and again, that's because of the late Labor Day. It essentially keeps, maintains the same calendar we've had, where the first day of school is the Wednesday before Labor Day, uh, which next year would be September 2nd for students in grades um, 1 through 12, kindergarten, preschool, a little later. Um, so it does maintain... Um, that consistency, but it's going to feel later. It is literally six days later than it was this year mm -hmm. uh, because of the change in Labor Day, uh, when Labor Day sits. Pretty much everything else is pretty constant for what we've had uh, in the past few years except for that factor. <coughs> and so uh, the way we typically do this is bring this for discussion uh, for the school committee and then a vote for uh, the committee in December. I want to note also that 
for those of you who may be newer to the committee, uh, more typically this was voted in the spring and it's been greatly appreciated by members of the staff and the community that the committee now takes this on before the end of the calendar year for people to do all sorts of planning. Mm -hmm. It also has some really positive implications for our facility staff who do, and our IS staff, our IT staff. They do a tremendous amount of work over the summer and knowing how many weeks they have has large implications for capital projects. Um, and those folks are actually really happy about the later start of school. It gives them another week sure. to do their work they need to do, uh, although um, they know the following summer probably is going to have the opposite problem. <laughs> so this is not a vote for this evening. Are there any questions or comments? Well, what was the narrow number two for AP, uh, for the union preference? I couldn't hear you. What was the narrow You said it was a narrow preference. What was the number? Do you know what the number two preference was of the three um, options? My assumption from my conversation, although I, I can't say, cite this specifically, was the third option, the 827 draft. Um, I think there was, there was broad concern from what I heard about the starting on 9-1 draft just because the end of the school year would go until June 28th mm -hmm. with five snow days. And um, so I think it was this in the packet, the second and third draft were the most popular options. Okay. Further questions or comments? Otherwise, we shall move on. Okay. By the way, do we, this is always a, like a secret reveal at the end. Do we have any gifts? I do not believe so, unless they were in the packet that Ms. Stansard has. I did not see them. I didn't see anything. Okay. Okay. Got us down, so I'm going to assume that we don't. Cool. All right. So then this, I think, is our last item. So uh, for the next, I guess I, I want to talk through December 10th and then the 11th, 12th. For the next meeting, we have a robust agenda as well. At least uh, if there are new high school courses, then uh, they need to be discussed um, based on our timeline. Policies uh, come back, and I just listed those two. Um, one is anti-harassment. Another one is, is one that I've talked about with the chair, um, and I hope it's okay to say that uh, last year um, I made a commitment uh, or made a statement that we were no longer going to use uh, Mass Corps, and there was a question of as to how, um, based on the feedback that I'd received from the community. And I think separate from the larger issue of Mass Corps, I think it's related, but not the same, is can we have a policy that sets a minimum wage for contractors to be consistent with prevailing wage or the minimum wage in the, in the Commonwealth? And so that certainly could be thought of in the context of Mass Corps, but I think it's more generally um, the right thing to at least consider how to do that. That's true, although my view of also it is that if, um, since we're going to have some transition on the school committee, um, toward the end of the year. My view is if we're going, if, if the committee is interested in addressing this issue, and I think narrowly defined, the question was um, essentially uh, adopting the, pr the prevailing minimum wage for the adult, for the working age population in the state. There's got to be a better phrasing than that. But essentially it's something like that. Because you can't, you can't be clever, because if you're clever then, um, Technically, the mass core wages are legal, right? right? So you can't. So that would actually be effectively the minimum. The minimum wage in the state would be what the mass core folks are, are getting, right. uh, the the inmates. Um, so, anyways, my point is, I, I thought that if the committee was interested, uh, then this committee should try to resolve that question. If we can't get to it. Then we like to do it later. Uh, um, can you tell me what is it? Mass core. I, it's How do you spell it? Is it an acronym? Oh, M A S S C O R. It? It's undoubtedly an acronym because everything the state does is. <laughs> um, and uh, but uh, basically, what it is is there's a there's a there's a program within the state um, prisons that um, provides services essentially um, uh, to the general population uh, through contracts through state contracting. Uh, using uh, inmate labor, okay, and they don't pay anything close to the, to a, what is the prevailing minimum wage in the state. And although people may have opinions about the question of whether we should or shouldn't hire folks who are incarcerated to do the work, um, and whether that's exploitative, the simple way to resolve the question mm -hmm. so that we're okay. never doing it again and we're on record would be adopting. Um, the prevailing minimum. general minimum wage okay. as a minimum standard for any uh, contractor. Okay, thank you. And that you. would resolve the question. So 
thoroughly. So we'd come back about athletic fields and a capital process to get that kick started, calendar vote, um, HR and diversity PD update, budget guidance, wellness approach and update, SETF goals and budget guidance. I want to look at Mr. Donis to make sure I captured that yes, accurately. Thank you. Uh, warrant review, and then this will be uh, a couple of days, three days after the Fort Town meeting, which is on December 7th, so um, some debriefing of where we are with regional assessment. Um, we could also push that off the, the last question if we don't have to, but um, we polled people and Neither date was perfect, but December 11th and 12th worked for certainly a quorum of the school committee. Both worked, <coughs> for, or either worked for a quorum of the school committee, um, but we, I don't know if we wanted to make a decision on that or um, where we are with that, that piece and whether we want to put some of the budget guidance and other budget items in that meeting since it's exclusively focused on that topic. I do have a question. Um, so I read somewhere that the new member of the school committee won't be seated until January, but should that person be able to participate in this meeting about budgets? And I think it was anticipated they'd be invited. Okay. Uh, we, I mean, we're not going to vote. I don't know. I don't think we'd be voting anything in the meeting anyway. So we right. could accord the it's liberties informational. of participation yeah. without. Okay. Step overstepping any boundaries okay. in that regard. Uh, so you want us to make a decision right now on a date? Um, I think it'd be beneficial in the near future if we did, and if we could do it mm -hmm. while everyone's here, that might be the I, best. I'm trying to remember. What what was the maximum number we got for either the 11th or the 12th? Uh, I think one was seven and one was eight, but some of it, depending on the timing of the meeting, it was a little... Fuzzy, but we had seven for both. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to disclose. Uh, <laughs> sorry to laugh. I, I, it, um, wouldn't, wouldn't you normally say then go with eight if the time is works right? And if it's if the default is seven, then flip a coin. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get we didn't get responses from every single. No, but I'm assuming. Sorry. Is yeah. it, actually let me ask you a different question. Is it? The, I, I think I know the answer. Is it the same person who can't make? Both meetings? Mm, I don't believe so. Good. Yeah. So, so this <laughs> just goes back to what I just said a second ago. If you can get a meeting date that has eight members instead of seven, yeah. go with that. Yeah. And if you can't, literally flip a coin. Okay. Heads is one date, tails is another. I'm not going to say one committee member is more important than another. So let's go with the twelfth then, because that was the most desirable for the largest number of okay. people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mr. Uh, other committee planning. Um, we had a really good presentation on the transportation analysis recently that di directly relates to our more general inquiry into later start times. Yeah. Um, so I think it would behoove us to get that back on some meeting agenda, later start times. Uh, okay. and, and just basically, you know, where we're all at with that. Okay. Is it okay if it's not the town? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why? Are there 27 things already? <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. <laughs> Yeah, okay, we got that. And then we, we talked earlier about, Mike, for a note, later in the year we're going to want to find another time to talk about math. I thought late January. Yeah, and, just, and then um, capital again. Mm -hmm. yep. Anything else for folks? As you recall, there's always an open door to offer other items on the agenda. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I think we were at some point going to talk about procedures for um, subcommittee members to get their... Items oh, onto the calendar. Absolutely. So I don't know if that um, should be a topic on the tenth, but I think it would be nice to start <coughs> and just standardize how we go about yes. those um, important tasks. Right. Yeah. So um, for the committee's benefit, we don't. I don't, and I think I'm right about this. We don't have any sort of standard operating procedures or sort of essentially like instructions, like how to, that standardizes how we ensure we uh, go through the process of appropriately finding a date, posting it, getting agendas set and distributed, what the template is for the agendas, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that soup the nuts, all the, little, all the things we do, which are, are burdensome but significant for any subcommittee, and we should do that. No one's disagreeing. For getting the... Like subcommittee scheduled or yeah. the, on the full committee? Well, agenda. both. I mean, if you go soup to nuts on that, you'd start with the process of literally getting it um, 
getting the subcommittee meeting done and established and done properly. But if you go to the back side of that process, it would be, well, now we've worked on something and we wanted to make sure we can schedule it appropriately to get on the agenda. So I think it means all those things. Yes. I just, I, I'm wondering if we could even take it a step further. I think uh, having a substantive conversation just about subcommittees in general um, at this committee level would make a lot of sense, you know, both about how, uh, you know, membership and, and uh, chairs and all of that is established. Mm -hmm. I think every subcommittee seems to have its own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be helpful, you know, I think for future school committees to just have that kind of guidance written down, you know, to explain what that process right. is. And I think similarly also just to think about how the subcommittee is held accountable by the, the regional school committee, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and how it reports its work uh, mm -hmm. to the committee and to the public. So, you know, I don't know what that would look like exactly, except to say that maybe a more substantive conversation where you could examine all those different pieces of right. the subcommittee work, how it, you know, it works. And I've raised this before too, I think sometimes too, for a time-strapped <laughs> committee, uh, you know, we have a lot of subcommittees, right? And so there's, you know, there's that co piece of the conversation as well. How do we juggle or balance uh, our responsibilities and duties? But I, I, I feel like it's been a big enough piece of, you know, um, of the work that we do that it merits its own agenda item, you know, in a future meeting. Ms. Pitzer, does that capture Yeah, that goes above and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> I think those, all those issues are important. Great. We'll take it on. Yeah, I was just, and we could follow up offline on this, but I just wonder if uh, MASC might have some guidance or thoughts that we could, or templates even, that we could work from as it relates to the questions that you cited mm -hmm. so that this committee's not feeling like it's, you know, that, that we could find some models that are working in other communities. Well, we've done that on other stuff. I mean, we should do that right. here, too. <coughs> yeah. so. Okay, great. Uh, anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? Oh, I move. Uh, <laughs> moved by Spitzer, seconded by Menino, I take it? Yes. Okay, all those in favor? <coughs> Motion carries unanimously with a stretch from Dr. Moss. <coughs>